Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 24th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and, as meeting papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by some of the MSPs during the meeting. Uh, we've got a full house this morning. No apologies been received from MSPs. Um, but before we move into this first public session properly, can I thank all those whom we met with us and share their knowledge of the National Housing First approach to tackling homelessness during our visit to Finland. Uh, the visit was hugely informative and it was enlightening to hear about the initiatives Finland is taking to eradicate homelessness. The committee would in particular like to thank the Y Foundation and uh, the, the vital role it has played in coordinating the visit and getting access to that to that information. A summary of the committee's visit uh, to Finland uh, is available on our webpage. Can I also thank the committee uh, clerking team for organising and supporting that that visit as well. I'm sure we'll talk about Housing First at some point uh, during the evidence session this morning, but we wanted to put that on the record. So um, the first uh, agenda item is, and I'm looking at perhaps my item two. Right, okay. Um, one more, why is it item two? All right, OK. Just checking, I've got my notes right. So the first uh, agenda item is indeed agenda item two, uh, homelessness, uh, and this is panel one. So can I welcome Councillor Kelly Parry, spokesperson for Community Wellbeing, and Nicola Dickey, policy manager at COSLA, uh, Patrick Mackay, operations manager, Turning Point Scotland, Dr Adam Burley, consultant clinical psychologist, the Access Point, and Lorraine McGrath, chief executive, Simon Community Scotland. Thank you all of you for being here this morning. Uh, and I understand um, Cosler would like to make a, an opening statement. I've not any other indication of any other witnesses, but I, I assure you have lots of opportunities to put your, your your thoughts and views on the record here this morning. So I don't know who's making the statement on behalf of Cosler. Is it Councillor Parry? Yeah, thanks, convener. Yeah. Um, first of all, good morning, um, and thanks for the opportunity to be here to provide local government's perspective on homelessness. Um, I'm Councillor Kelly Parry. I'm a councillor in Midlothian, and I'm here today representing uh, COSLA in the role of spokesperson for community wellbeing. Throughout my time as an elected member, uh, it's very clear to me the sense of responsibility that everyone in local government feels to our communities and that responsibility drives councils to continue to achieve the best outcomes for those who are homeless or perhaps more importantly at risk of becoming homeless across Scotland. Yes, we do have a statutory responsibility and a duty around this area. However, councils recognise the wide-reaching effect homelessness has on families and individuals in our communities. That's why councils, it's more than seen to our statutory obligations and access to good affordable housing. It's a place to call home. Um, and those are the things that we know that lead to strong, stable and sustainable communities. Local government, certainly in my view, exists to serve all members of our communities and that's very much what we're striving to do. Um, in our uh, written submission, which I, I hope the committee has received, we advocate an integrated uh, whole system approach to preventing and responding to homelessness. The causes of homelessness are seldom simple, I'm sure the committee are well aware of that. Um, they're certainly not singular and it's only through working together that we can support those in need uh, and work to address the social inequalities that affect so many of those who find themselves homeless and impact on the reasons why people find themselves homeless. Um, so with that, I look forward to our discussions this morning, convener. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, thank you again for coming along. Can we move to our first question from Andy Whiteman, MSP. Thank you very much, convener. Um, we've heard a lot of talk of housing options and how it's gone, and there's obviously been quite a bit of success in that programme. But we've also heard that at the um, more difficult, with, with more difficult groups, it's got its challenges. Is there a need for a programme of improvement um, for housing uh, options? And if so, you know, what might that look like? Would anyone... Thank you, Lorraine. Lorraine McGrath. Good morning. Um, I think absolutely. Sam Community Scotland and actually street work that I'm now involved with as well here in Edinburgh are both concerned with working with people with intensive, extreme and complex needs. Um, and our experience is very much that the housing option system and approach works for the vast majority of people that come through the process, but is extremely challenging and difficult for people with complex needs. It's not easy for people to engage with. It's not easy for people to keep um, appointments respond to that 
the flexibility within the support arrangements that we have does not allow us the time necessarily to actually spend the significant amount of time it takes to work through that process with someone through the housing options. So in short, the answer is yes. I would absolutely welcome um, a specific approach around housing options for people with complex needs and that to be tied very closely in with a direct access to housing and a rapid access to housing approach on the basis of the housing first principles. Okay, uh, Dr. Barley. Oh, really, just to uh, support what Lorraine is saying, I think from a, uh, I'm obviously a psychologist, I think from a psychological point of view, as with many things in this area, sometimes the, the, the idea of homelessness is something of a red herring in that it covers up what has brought somebody to be in the position of being homeless in the first place. And the problem with missing that is that we start to provide uh, the provision of absence, if you like. So we try and provide housing with an idea that housing is the problem, and there is a range of uh, difficulties around housing. But for some of the people that we're talking about, the difficulties are very... The homelessness is a late emerging symptom is probably the best way to think about it, and to sort of try and understand what it is that has got somebody to the point where they cannot or they struggle to make use of the existing housing service. Now, that is, those are factors and variables that we can describe and know a fair amount about, but I still don't think that we organise some of our housing provision based upon a sound formulation or understanding of what the psychological and emotional needs are of the people who require that housing. In simple sort of Legoland terms, really, if some of your experience of being in a house through your development has been coloured with huge amounts of trauma, anxiety and adversity, then the craziness would be for you to go and stay in a house and, and sort of exist in it in a very straightforward, anxiety-free way. And we see that a lot of people sort of bouncing in and out of houses, and we keep trying to understand it as a housing problem rather than as being a human problem, I guess, in some way. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to add in relation to uh, housing options? Uh, Councillor Parry. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, I, I think in general we think that housing options um, works very well. I think we would like to see perhaps improvements in the housing options service. Um, we completely appreciate the needs uh, or certainly a desire for a, a standard um, protocol. Um, you know, we understand the need to be able to measure outcomes, but I think I would reiterate um, what colleagues have said is that um, I think certainly from a statutory point of view, councils you know, quite rightly focus on homelessness, but I think we need to be looking at people who are at risk of homelessness because we know that when we put in preventative measures um, across all areas um, of social policy, we know that that has a real impact. And I think that perhaps it's sometimes difficult um, to measure that in terms of output because when you've put preventative spend early into the system, you don't necessarily have um, a positive outcome. It isn't necessarily very easy to record. Um, so I think that that's something that we have to focus on um, and really look at and, and find a measurable way to do that, that we do quite well in other services, that perhaps um, a shift in focus and a shift in language and terminology towards those at risk of homelessness rather than at the crisis points that we've mentioned. OK, now, not everyone has to answer every question, but I, I don't know if Nicola Dick or Patrick McKay wants to add anything to that before I bring Andy back in. OK, Andy Whiteman. That's useful. Can I, can I take it from your responses in general, then, that um, you would see no particular advantage in putting housing options on a firmer statutory footing, for example, that, that what, what it's done, the delivery, it's, 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 uh, what it's delivered, the flexibility it's got, improvements that might be possible to make can all be made as, as it is at the moment, and that for groups with very, very different needs, then we're looking at possibly other issues like Housing First, which we'll get on to later, um, to address. Would that be a fair summation of your views? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the only thing that you could say in terms of the group that housing options particularly fails, which is those who have multiple complex needs, one of the, the I suppose, the interventions we know that works best is when you reach out to that group so that there's much more of an assertive outreach component to it. So there's nothing to, you know, there's nothing to stop a housing options model being used in a different way so that that group still gets a quality of access to it. Um, yeah, I'd very much agree with that, and I think in principle, um, you know, take, taking something on that foot and wouldn't be an issue. I would just urge that um, the one thing that local authorities do very good is around local flexibility and knowing what's right um, in our uh, local location. So I think as long as there's flexibility is built into that, it's a really important aspect. Okay, Lorraine McGrath. 
Um, I would agree with that. Um, my only other comment would be that though sometimes that local flexibility leads to massive variation in, in how people are responded to um, and the way that people are, you know, that the data is recorded as well as a, as a result of housing options in, in the Prevent 1. It, there is a major variation in how that comes through and we're not then able to use that intelligence um, in an informed way to plan for the future. Nicola Dickey wanted to come at that point. I mean, I absolutely echo everything that everyone's just said there. I suppose from a COSLA perspective, what, what we would like is standardisation of process. You're not going to get standardisation of outcome because of the complexities that you're dealing with. So what we're looking for is everyone approaching housing options in a consistent manner. Um, the difficulty with a statutory obligation is that um, that statutory obligation becomes a bit of a blunt instrument, perhaps. So I think for us, the, 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 the success in the housing options, where we are seeing success, is that subtlety. It is that local ability to respond well to those complex needs and to those different um, circumstances. I'm yet to see the bit of legislation that does that um, effectively. So from a COSLA perspective, we're about using the good practice that we already have. We're about spreading that across Scotland and making sure that that we can get consistent um, processes and consistent recording so that we know that we're, we're looking at you know apples and apples but not to, to, to be using you know a kind of blunt instrument that is that is something written in statute that's that's not what we've seen working um, today in this um, arena okay Andy Whiteman okay, thanks very much just one final question on this part I'll come in uh, later uh, as well um, on the question of refugees and asylum seekers is quite a bit of evidence um, on that in uh, the written evidence we've received um, I just wonder if you anyone has any observations on what you know the particular priorities we need to address in relationship to the housing needs of of those of that group I, I think there's somebody speaking from Scottish Refugee Council in the next panel so that might be something they would be best placed to answer we won't push in comments on that. We just want to make sure we cover the range of questions that we'll be dealing with within the inquiry. So if, I don't know if there are any additional comments in relation to that just now. OK, thank you. Um, thank you, Andy. Uh, Jenny Gordon. Thank you, Peter. Good morning to the panel. Um, Kozla, in the, the written submission we received, um, Kelly Parry and Nicola Dickey, um, you talk about this person-centred, a local partnership basis, which you mentioned in your opening uh, comments. And Dr Burley, in your written submission, um, you spoke about if a person experiences high levels of trauma, abuse and neglect through the first 10 years of their life, then it is highly unlikely that 18 months in a supported unit will be enough to change their mind. Um, with regard to that, what is the panel's view then in terms of how care experienced young people are dealt with uh, by the system currently in terms of homelessness? Dr. Burley, yeah. I, I think ex exactly as I, as I said there. I think you know from a to to take the, the 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 phrase or the term psychologically informed properly, and to actually use it to design housing and care services for people who we know have had those sorts of experiences. You would you would never come up with a sort of time limit on supported accommodation that was just some arbitrary number like six months or 18 months, for which there is absolutely no evidence base uh, would in any way <laughs> fit in with an understanding of how human psychology works or how the sort of length of time and care that might be required to modify somebody's experience of, of relationships given the sorts of backgrounds they may have come from. Um, so really, I think that, that, that that's sort of my uh, sort of position on it really is, is something about you know, maybe an, an idealist position, but how, how can you get to a point where you actually have housing and care services that are informed by a solid, sound understanding of what the needs actually are, rather than a sort of top-down, oh, this person's homeless, so therefore they need this, and they've got care needs of this, this, and this, so we'll provide them with this, without any real articulation or formulation of how is it that this person has found themselves in this position in the first place? And as I said, these are not variables that we that we don't know about. We do have a fair amount of evidence that would tell us what kind of interventions might be required and what sort of timescales might be required to actually address the underlying issues that so often underpin the symptomatic presentation of homelessness. I 
I think it's important to acknowledge as well the difference across different local authorities. Um, that one of the things that we see, for example, within local authorities which are bigger, like Glasgow and the City of Edinburgh Council, is the ability to commission specific services for young people who've been looked after and accommodated. And where I suppose Turning Point Scotland would see sometimes a difficulty is that in smaller local authorities, where there's less purchasing power, that those young people who have been looked after and accommodated become part of another type of service provision, often services which are more for people affected by homelessness, sometimes with a different age range within that actual setting, and I think that can be hugely problematic. What might be an answer within it, um, something I've all often thought, is that you had greater flexibility for spot purchasing right across Scotland, so that you had where there was maybe um, a, one of the, the pan-Glasgow local authorities identifying a good service within Glasgow. I think that we should have flexibility to enable young people to go into those services. OK, Councillor Parry. Um, yeah, I, I would certainly reiterate some of those points. And I think, um, for example, the um, recent announcement Nicola Sturgeon made on council tax um, for people, uh, for young care experienced people is certainly welcome. Um, and that just shows, uh, you, you know, where local authorities can um, make quite a big change. Um, and I think it's right to pick up the point about what we do before people get to that crisis point. And I say that both from a COSLA perspective and as a care experienced uh, young person who left care um, from that point of view. Um, so I, I think it has to be um, the right things in place, but I think it's very much about following uh, the person um, rather than the system. And I think that's something that you probably uh, found on your recent trip as well, uh, convener, that you know the, the resources should, should follow the person what's right in one local authority won't necessarily um, work in another local authority. I think sometimes it's very easy to um, look at standardised frameworks and think that will fit everywhere, but um, it has to be the person at the centre of that, and that's uh, more important. OK, anyone else want to add on that? Uh, Jenny goes to come Thank back Thank you, Convener. Um, Lorraine, with regard to your submission from the Simon community, um, you, you note in your evidence submission that we are beginning to see evidence of increased housing access barriers for those to RSL and private rented sector accommodation. This is resulting in larger stays uh, with temporary accommodation. You also say that we are already seeing significant uh, deficits in funding due to the impact of welfare reform. Uh, welfare reform has already been flagged to this committee, um, previously by Shelter, who said that the government in Scotland can only do so much in terms of mitigation. Um, and the National Audit Office has previously alluded to the impact that these welfare reforms are having in terms of England's homeless population. With that in mind, I'd just like to ask the rest of the panel what impact welfare reforms in their experience are having on homelessness more generally. Hey, Councillor Parry. Uh, thanks. Um, from a causal point of view, that's perhaps a very obvious point, um, but we certainly um, looked at universal credit um, quite a, a lot recently. Not only does universal credit have an impact on, on a person, a person's experience and how much uh, trauma they experience in the system, but also has an impact on council budgets as well. And we're well aware the Scottish Government is uh, mitigating a fair impact to welfare reforms, but so are local authorities. Um, and that squeezes our budgets um, at a time where when welfare reform um, is having a higher impact, we need to be focusing our, uh, and targeting our services more. Um, for example, we know that if we spend uh, money on the front line looking at benefit uptake, we know that that brings in more money to our local authorities, but we're spending money mitigating welfare reform, and that um, obviously harms uh, local authorities' ability uh, and resources to be able to, to tackle that. Um, from a different point of view, um, we know that people are getting into rent arrears. We know that um, not only is there more people in rent arrears, but the amount that they owe uh, is significantly more. In some cases, uh, it's much higher. Um, the statistics that COSLA um, collected recently when we wrote to uh, David Gawke about universal credit to ask um, him to pause that um, were startling. They really were. That has an impact in terms of our long-term house building strategies um, as well. And... Um, you, you know, the only way to mitigate that would be to, to look at rent increases. So as far as uh, we are concerned from a causal point of view, it's a perfect storm in terms of local authorities. Um, um, you know, I can't reiterate how much the impact on, on people is, but there is an impact on our resources at a time when we're already challenged. Any other comments? Welfare reform, homelessness issues, opportunities? 
Patrick um, Mackay. Just, I mean, I'll give you one specific example, and it's I think about sometimes what you see with welfare reform is a change in behaviours from other organisations. And even one of the obstacles that um, service managers in Turning Point Scotland have spoken to me about is the fact that um, within Glasgow as a stock transfer local authority, there's a, obviously a reliance within the RSL sector. And in instances now, what we see is homeless people, and people affected by homelessness, make that transition when they're at their poorest and having to pay a month's arrears, you know, paying a month in advance. Um, and for me, that just creates another additional obstacle to somebody accessing housing. Okay. Jenny Gwyneth, do you want to follow up? Yeah. Can I just, before we move on uh, um, to, to a deputy convener, Temp the use of temporary accommodation was mentioned. I'm conscious that crisis <coughs> have recently called uh, for the use obligations to be taken forward by the Scottish Government and local authorities in relation to the uh, the unsuitable use of inappropriate temporary accommodation in this place just passed uh, an order reducing that from 14 days to 7 days for pregnant women for families but but not for for others and uh, at a recent event I had with, with crisis they were talking about eradicating what is a costly and inappropriate use of still a network of B&Bs where people have to uh, not even aren't even allowed to stay in the B and B throughout the day. They have to leave. They've no way to wash their clothes. No way to cook food. Hugely expensive and hugely damaging to the individuals. There's a key ask there that that crisis have made. I saw Dr. Burley wanted to maybe comment on that. I mean, I in terms of sort of uh, you know clinically, it, it's not uncommon to hear people talk about the the accommodation that they're in. Again, I think from a an inform if you were if you were coming up with an informed way of addressing, and I'm talking, I guess, about some of the most multiply complex people, and you, and you were trying to think about what sort of provision you might want to, to give that might address some of the underlying issues, knowing something about the backgrounds that people have come from in terms of the levels of deprivation and adversity, the very, very first thing on your design sheet, if you were going to try and design something to address that, would be not that not the history that somebody has come from. And yet when you hear and look at some of the accommodation that's being offered to people, some of the most traumatised and damaged people in our communities, the, the, the temporary accommodation that is offered is often a direct, a direct replication of the adversity that, they, that has brought them into our services in the first place. OK, that's helpful. Uh, Lorraine McGrath, hold on to that thought because... I believe I may just have stepped in the toes of one of our members who wanted to ask about temporary accommodation. So, Graham, is there anything additional you want to add in relation to questions on temporary accommodation before we bring the witnesses back <coughs> in? Pretty similar to your own uh, uh, convener. Um, it was really to um, ask you to uh, give us your views on the, the, the quality of temporary accommodation, because we've certainly heard evidence uh, that it's often uh, sadly lacking. Um, so, I'd like like to hear about that. And I, I, just if, if I may, convener, also ask um, if COSLA uh, has done any work on analysing um, the the cause of rent arrears. You, uh, Councillor Parry, you mentioned rent arrears, uh, and of course there can be a, a lot of different reasons why people run up rent arrears. I wonder if there's done done any analysis um, as to you know, what, what, what the percentage of uh, rent arrears across Scotland might be as a, a result of welfare reform or other reasons. Okay, you were going to come back, come back in there. Sorry for stopping. I was just conscious that um, I must have someone to explore some of this area as well. So, Lorraine McGrath. Um, just on the point of quality of temporary accommodation, uh, um, it, and connecting those two, those two queries, it is absolutely about the quality. Um, and the problem that we've got is that um, local authorities are so constrained that they are commissioning very, very poor quality um, accommodation. And it's really a challenge to then work with those commission services um, to improve them. There's been a lot of work done in Glasgow to improve the quality of temporary accommodation. There's also work ongoing here in Edinburgh to uh, improve the quality of bed and breakfast accommodation because we have such a huge reliance on it here in Edinburgh. It's not so much about saying bed and breakfast, all bed and breakfast is bad as a stopgap emergency response. It is good for some people. One of the un unintended consequences of housing options, sorry, just to go back one step, is that we now see um, a much more uh, 
concentrated population of people with complex needs coming into homelessness. And that means that the nature of the temporary and emergency accommodation that we need to look at does need to change. The, the days of people being able to cope with, even in the short term, a bed and breakfast where you can't even stay during the day um, and the quality of the environment is really poor, picking up on all the points that Adam's just made, um, are gone. We really need to think about the positive and constructive environments that we put people into um, from the very first point of contact. We would not do that with any other uh, care needed uh, people with care needs population or any other care group. We would not consider that for a second as a nation. Um, we are looking at the vast majority of people in homelessness now having significant and complex needs and their mental health needs, their physical health needs, their long-term enduring trauma and impacts. We would not consider placing someone who enters the health system as a result of those needs into the type of accommodation we put people in homelessness into. So I think there's a, there has to be an absolute massive agenda around improving the quality of the accommodation and not just the nature of it. Thank you, Dr Burley. It's really a coda to what uh, Lorraine's been describing. I think one of the, th the things it, that is problematic that we have health and social care integration, but housing is not part of that. So we don't start thinking about housing as a health intervention. So somebody is in housing with some idea that that is separate from their health needs and then they are meant to go somewhere else to get their health needs addressed, like we could in some way split those bits off. But for some of the people we are talking about, one, we know that they really struggle to make use of mainstream services, for which, for reasons which we can, can elaborate. And so in terms of the, the fundamental health care provision is often provided by housing, but often I guess the housing is not in any way engineered or geared or organised or designed or funded it as t as being a healthcare intervention, but that is fundamentally where a lot of the people we are talking about spend a good deal of their time. And so I think it's about how we could integrate health, social care, and housing together for this most vulnerable population to understand that their needs are not discrete and don't happen in silos. But we are talking about whole people. Absolutely, there's, there's, that, that got a reaction, Dr. Burley. This, this is a good thing. Um, there's also a theme about the quality of temporary accommodation wrapped around that as well. So just kind of bear that in mind. We've all come on to look at complex needs um, further. Uh, Patrick Mackay, followed by Councillor Parry. I just, I just I wanted to maybe, it's, it's a, a matter of precision, what we mean by temporary accommodation, mm -hmm. that some people talk interchangeably with temporary accommodation as supported accommodation. So there's something about, I, I think, as, if you look at it as a kind of whole system, there is something when people are being um, referred into supported accommodation, some of which is very, very good, but I think that, we, that there's still a failure within that system for individuals who have the most complex needs. And ironically, often what happens is those people who have the greatest need finish up in bed and breakfast. And there's something, I think there's a very specific reason for that, is one of the things that bed and breakfast offer is, is a notion of something being um, high, high threshold, low tolerance, um, and within that, you, you know, it's about their ability to, to, to be able to stay alongside people. But, and we maybe come on to this, I think that the key to, to all of that is that if those people with the most complex needs are never put into supported accommodation, but instead put into a housing first model, which has an appropriate level of support wrapped around, I think that is a much better outcome. We're going to explore that for a few moments. Uh, Councillor Parry. Um, yeah, I guess I would um, urge some caution um, around temporary accommodation statistics. Um, for some, moving into temporary accommodation can be the right thing to do. And I think the important thing to focus on, perhaps, is what happens after that. And if that leads to a stable tenancy, for example, and a stable period in somebody's life, um, then sometimes that's the best thing for that person. So I think it really has to be an outcome-focused uh, approach when we look at temporary accommodation. But we're absolutely right to focus on uh, the standards uh, of that accommodation at the time as well. Um, just to pick up your point on rent arrears, um, COSLA has um, collected some statistics on rent arrears and I'm sure we'd be happy to share that with the committee. Um, it's perhaps somewhat limited in terms of it focused um, on universal credit, but what it did do was it made um, comparisons between um, rent arrears where people were on the older system of housing benefit and the newer system of universal credit, and I think that gives us um, a useful insight into what that might mean um, in terms of the whole impact for Scotland, because I think 
you know, we're certainly talking quite a lot about what we need to do reactively, but actually I think we need to start a planning forward thinking approach. And we know that universe, or universal credit is likely to uh, be rolled out um, across Scotland, although COSLA would like it, that to be at a much slower pace because of those particular issues. So I think that there's work that we can do around that um, and work that we can do to plan that. And I think the other uh, group, just to, to finish convener, um, that we need to look at is people um, who are now struggling from in-work poverty. Now, because of the very nature of people who are in work poverty, they're not people that are normally likely to come in contact with um, other sector organisations or um, local authority points where we would see that they're at risk of homelessness. Um, and I think that's one of the messages that's, that's quite clear from us all today. That's where we need to focus on. But for that group, it's so difficult. Um, they tend to be the, the people that will only come forward when they're, you know, they've exhausted all their family, friends, all the other options. Um, so th it's really difficult to try and get to a group that, that don't normally come into contact with us. But I'd be happy to share those if the committee would like. I think Nicola Dickey wants to yeah, add to that. It's just really to pick up on the um, the unsuitable accommodation, and I think we have to be really, really clear on what we mean when we talk about temporary accommodation. I think that the, the, the other panel members are absolutely clear. We use these words interchangeably, and I think fr from our perspective, we would be looking for a proportionate response. So. In order to get a proportionate response, you have to have an evidence base that, that tells you what is the unsuitable accommodation and where is it? Because there are some local authorities in Scotland who, who don't have any, what we would talk about as unsuitable accommodation. There are some local authorities who do, and I think a lot of those local authorities are on a journey. But I think for us, it should be about how can we help those local authorities um, to move forward and get people out of unsuitable accommodation and, and minimise those who are, who are actually in it. So from our perspective, it would be really helpful if we had a, a kind of definitive evidence in space that we were starting from here to try and kind of unpick that a bit because I think we do um, get get ourselves kind of we, we, we muddle up supported accommodation b and b accommodation and temporary accommodation some people in temporary accommodation are in what is effectively a scatter flat and it looks exactly like the one next door that's a mainstream flat so I think we just have to be a bit a bit cautious about that evidence base is it there and can we use it helpfully okay yeah, Lorraine McGrath just one small point and, and, and follow up to that um, I would my added caution would be who deems it unsuitable um, and whether or not the people with the experience of living in those accommodations are the best place to tell you whether or not it's suitable to their needs. Um, and that takes us back to the impact that it's had on their health and wellbeing um, and, their, and their anticipation for the future. Thank you. Now, I know our Deputy Convener wants, wants a supplementary on this, but Graham, do you want to follow up first? Uh, just to say, I think from Cosler's point of view, if you could provide that information, that would be very useful. Um, I remember when I was a councillor in South Lanarkshire, um, and we were regularly gi given these figures, and sometimes it was quite surprising, because you, you might have expected that um, a, large a large proportion of rent arrears were a result of uh, wel welfare reform, and very often they weren't. Uh, so. It would be useful to have the facts. I think it's fair to say that the, the, the evidence we were gathering was specifically around about universal credit. So yeah. it was about us looking at what, what is the percentage of rented years for people who are on the old system, what is the percentage of people who are not claiming any benefit whatsoever, what's the percentage for people on universal credit. Um, I think it's it, it was in and around about the idea that the universal credit programme has that universal credit, their years go up and then you get your first payment and they go down. So, so the, yeah. the information that we have is, is specific in and around about that. We also have evidence around about how much more Scottish welfare fund is being used in the areas. So I think that, that gives you the human cost, not just the housing cost, the human cost potentially. Yeah. We, 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 will, that. we'll, we really appreciate we'll, we'll that. We'll forward you that one, <coughs> yeah. absolutely. Elaine Smith, do you want to follow up on something? Yeah, that? thanks. Convener, it was actually on the point Lorraine McGrath made, but I wished to ask Cosla about it. it was for, for example, if temporary accommodation was a so-called scattered flat in a local authority area, and if that um, if that accommodation actually was suitable for the family, so a, a family were in it and they were accessing local school services, etc., would it make more sense then to try and turn that into permanent accommodation and then find for other temporary accommodation to replace it? I guess I, uh, Patrick Mackay is nodding, so maybe... I'm from, I'm, from, I'm from Turning Point Scotland and I oh, just, sorry. sorry but it's absolutely yes I, I think that everything that we know what Adam talks about around attachment that kids are you know going to school there's long periods of time in which they're in 
And again, it's about being very specific. We're talking about temporary furnished flats that people can be in for over a year. Um, and, and for me, it just seems the most simple thing in the world. Why can't you convert that into a proper secure tenancy? But it's, I suppose, a symptom. That from a, from a COSLA perspective, there are some local authorities who do that to a greater or lesser extent. The, the, the problem is, is that we don't have um, pre-made, furnished, temporary accommodation units just to replace them. And I suppose that brings me back to the point that Councillor Parry made about the affordable housing supply programmes. So I think, yes, that's the most natural thing in the world to do. And I think it sounds quite simple. I think some local authorities do do it. I think... Um, that really very much depends on what is the housing market in and around about and what is the um, the needs presenting in your area. Um, so I think I don't think we're saying that that's a bad idea. I just think it sounds quite simple. And I think in practice, um, we, we, we need to explore that. And again, I don't think we can direct it nationally. I think local authorities have to look at their own housing market and what they have available to them. But is, sorry, convener, but is that something that COSLA could take an overview interest in to find out which local authorities are doing that, how they're doing it successfully and sharing good practice and maybe sharing that kind of information with this committee? I, I think that's absolutely something that we can we can take away and I suspect that probably a lateral um, may, may well be best placed to tell you where where that is effectively standard practice. Okay. So we can certainly take that away and come back with Thank what you. information we have. That really helpful. Can I also apologise to Deputy Convener because when you asked the question I started answering it and it's my job to ask the question is not, not answer it. But I also know from my own constituency case work and turning point, I think are based in Maryhill and Springburn, you've, you've got an office there is you know, a lot of vulnerable people enter temporary tenancies. Sometimes they make it work, sometimes they don't. It does seem crazy that when they make it work, they've built up a network of friends. They're not acting out in the community. They're being good neighbours that they are then moved on for another vulnerable individual or family to come in who might or might not make a success of that temporary tenancy. So there's actually less of a burden on communities and more of a community cohesion if these temporary furnished flats are flipped into secure tenancies for individuals and families. That's certainly my experience within my constituency, and that's me indulging a little bit as, as Chair Deputy, even though I do apologise. Um, but I did mention vulnerable people there. Um, uh, I know Alexander Schutt wants, wants to explore some more in relation to that. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'd, I'd like to explore the, the idea about this whole multi-agency approach, uh, which has been very successful across some parts uh, uh, of, of the areas that, that we're looking at. Uh, and in practice, uh, how that multi-agency works. Uh, and, and do we need to be thinking about restructuring how we budget, how we commission services to ensure that that is taking place? I'd like some views on that from the panel. Oh, flurry of hands there <laughs> at the last minute. We'll take Lorraine McGrath first. Um, I, I, in my evidence, obviously, the written evidence, we submitted a, some detail about the CAN initiative in Glasgow um, that both ourselves and Turning Point Scotland have just recently joined. Um, we've been operating that along with other partners in the city for oh, nearly three years now. Um, and that is, was specifically targeted at doing better with what we have rather than thinking about you know, what more do we need? Um, and coming together to work cohesively and collaboratively to target those most uh, extreme needs and the people that have every, that were known to everybody um, has been within the system for a long time and for whom no solution could be found. Um, what makes that work is attitude and culture and flexibility um, and, and the freedom for the frontline staff to actually engage and act and devolve power right to the frontline staff. That's what principally makes it work that people are empowered not to be constrained by um, four hours per week or X number of people per week. It's flexibility within the system and it's flexibility within professional boundaries to be able to work across in the interests of the individual. So it is person-centred approaches at its most extreme is what works for that person. Um, and that includes a housing response as well, actually. Um, so that What's talked about with that person who has extreme needs is what accommodation will suit you best right now, and then the team work to make that accommodation option happen. That doesn't happen within the homeless system in any other place. You know, it's what's available, and you, and generally speaking, because of pressures within the system, and then and that's where that that individual goes, and invariably for people with the most extreme and complex needs, that will then break down repeatedly um, and what we're seeing is a, a greater increase in stability for people over time people who were entrenched rough sleepers 
consistently um, offending, bouncing in and out of the system, in and out of hospital, in and out of prison. Um, and it is the cohesion very much that we've been able to achieve at that frontline service delivery around the key workers and the professionals that are engaged who come together to work um, in a collaborative way. Um, do we need to change the way that we commission services? Absolutely. Um, one of the key things in Glasgow, obviously, is that we do have homelessness as part of, of, of the devolved powers for the Health and Social Care Partnership. I think that's critical. I think this would be much more challenging in other areas where that is, is not the case. Um, and that's certainly my experience where homelessness sits much more in a housing agenda rather than a, a health and social care agenda. And that's already been, been mentioned. Um, Another thing that we're doing in Glasgow that is, is built on the principles of the CAN is moving to an alliance contracting position for the whole of Homelessness Commission, um, which should, if we get it right, empower exactly that type of working where organisations can come together to look who's best placed to do what around a grouping of people or an individual to get the best possible response. So it is personalisation at its most extreme level. Um, and there are options out there around the commissioning of services that would allow that, that bring both statutory services, third sector services and independent sector services, if need be, together around the table to empower that flexibility um, and opportunity. Councillor Parry wanted to come in and I'll take you in after that, Dr Burley. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's uh, two points to that. There's um, how we work together before somebody reaches the point of homelessness and then how somebody uh, or how agencies can work together after that to make sure that people go on to have stable um, tenancies in life to make sure that they don't become a recurring homeless person, which is incredibly common and what often leads up to uh, somebody rough sleeping. So we know that when we take um, preventive measures, it works very well. We're now seeing integrated joint boards and local authorities uh, beginning to work with housing and that's working incredibly well. I think it'll take some time to see um, data in terms of what that means in terms of results. But certainly, anecdotally, it's working. Um, and the work around the Scottish Prison Service is doing at the moment as well. Community justice partnerships and local authorities has already seen incredible results. So we know that when we put the preventative measures in there, it definitely works. I think there are some barriers in terms of um, agencies working together and either um, perhaps not having the resources to put preventative spend in, even when it will then affect uh, their service further down the line. Um, and sometimes there's legislative uh, barriers to, to doing that and working better together as well. And I think once people um, reach the point of uh, homelessness and, and a local authority steps in and, and for example, houses that person, um, you know, we, we can't just house a person and then just leave them. Um, there's likely to have been um, a level of trauma and crisis um, up to that point gets there. And often when you speak to people who have become homeless, you find that they've got a story where they've went through five, six, seven different agencies. So I, you know, I think we have to stop thinking about homelessness as a, as a housing issue and start thinking about it as a whole society issue and start talking to a range of different sectors about what part they play in the lead up to that. Hey, Dr Burley? I think um, uh, I, I would echo a lot of that. I think Interagency work, inter-anything work, begins with a shared understanding, and I think fundamentally we don't have that. Um, if you take the health service, for example, which I was brought up in, <laughs> uh, professionally at least, um, it still runs on an institutionally autistic idea, I think fundamentally, that everybody can make use of care in a completely anxiety-free way. We set up our clinics and our services based on an idea that people can come along and get into relationship with care completely ordinarily and most of us can do that without even noticing i guess one of the things that we know about people who've come from very adverse experiences is that their relationship with care is fundamentally compromised by that that the, the trust they have in getting into relationship with another is is massively disturbed by the experiences they've had i think um Typically, the way we respond to that, certainly in the health service, is by doing things like discharging people who don't turn up without sort of becoming interested. And I wonder if you're not turning up is telling us something about your bigger health problem, which is you don't trust care. And those are sort of things that underpin the inverse care law in that the people who can make good use of care get all the care and can deal with fragmented, siloed services because they can easily navigate the relationships between them. I think the population we, with, we work with really articulate in this area the need for 
a shared understanding that is fundamental in its nature about the relationship with care, that the relationships that anybody has and their capacity to trust and make use of other human beings are the, the fundamental rate-determining step in all health be that the relationship be that be that relationship with housing services health services third sector services it is the rate determining step now if everybody shared that understanding it would be very obvious that we'd all have to work together and you know based on that kind of uh, that sort of principle and we wouldn't set up services that required people to engage in relationships in particular sorts of ways we would know that we might have to adapt the ways in which we relate to others to provide care to people personal centred care package is exactly what we should be trying to aspire to uh, and some areas are managing to do that extremely well. We've taken evidence from individuals to tell us that sometimes agencies work against them in, in what they're trying to achieve mm -hmm. uh, and they don't get what they want from one so they end up having to go somewhere else. So this whole multi-agency process doesn't work for them uh, but they have to identify themselves where they think they can get the support. Uh, but you know, you've, you've touched on how local authorities can manage this forward. And yes, there are many local authorities who still look at the housing process uh, and believe that that's the solution. Uh, but but in, in reality, uh, that isn't the solution for the individual. The individual just wants the process to be less and, and, and to examine that. So, so how can we uh, examine that and look at that and say, well, you need to change some areas have changed, but other people are quite resistant to change uh, and, and make that happen to ensure that there is that multi-approach. Patrick McKay, then Dr Burley. Um, I, d I think an example of good practice is where, and what we hear within some local authorities now, is talking of vulnerable adults. So rather than all these multiple labels of thinking about people in terms of their mental health, separate from their criminal justice, separate from their homelessness, and I think that when you, when you harmonise that with commissioning processes, then I think we start to achieve some of the stuff that was identified way back within the Christie report, where people stop thinking within silos. But in order for that to truly become implementable, it's not just about thinking a silo, it's about actually funding differently, moving monies in a different way. Dr Parley? Yeah, yeah, well, there's a lot to say on this, I think, uh, um, but I won't say it all. But I think some of the, the resistances are... Specialism is a very interesting one. You know, we, we can get very invested in the business of doing something specialist. Um, and, and so I think, again, I think our services drift towards being specialist services, like in... In, in mental health services, with alcohol services, eating disorder services, depression services, like they're different. Like in some way we're talking about different discrete elements. And of course, I'd say the people who can go along and navigate those sorts of splits and do those different relationships do quite well actually within the health service and it works all fine. One of the, re one of the main reasons I guess I come across in terms of the people I work is with is why they have not been able to make use of care. There's plenty of care out there. One of the things I noticed when I first came into the homeless sector is it's not short of care provision. There's plenty of goodies on the table, but there seems to be a problem in terms of the relationship between the people who need that care and the people who are providing it. We discharge... Hu in, the, in the 15 years I've been working in the access practice, we have managed all of the people who come through the access practice have a history of trauma. How many do you think we managed to get into the specialist trauma centre in the NHS up at Morningside? I mean, it doesn't happen. No. Because what is required for you to access a trauma service is to get an appointment letter, go up there, sit in a waiting room, go into a room with somebody, talk about yourself, go away, come back for the next week's appointment, and do that for a period of 14 weeks to get treatment. And if you don't do that, then you are discharged because you weren't engaging rather than you happen to be engaging in an ambivalent way based on the adversity you had in your history. We don't operate along those lines. We assume that everybody can make use of care and if you don't make use of care, it's because you either don't want it or you're not engaging or some other kind of thing that's located in you, not in us and how we set up our services. Thank you, it's been a very interesting yeah, uh, supplementary, Kenneth Gibson? Yeah, yeah, yeah a, a supplementary actually on that was basically, I mean, in, in the COSLA paper, um, it says partnership working between agencies at an area-based level is the best way to deliver improved outcomes and local authorities are clearly wish to encourage partnership working at all levels and we've he heard about that and I think everyone would agree with that. So I'm just really wanting to ask, um, is there any way where this doesn't actually happen? I mean, where are there gaps, if there are indeed gaps in partnership working across Scotland and is the 
third sector and private sectors, are they both fully involved in terms of this partnership working across Scotland? Councillor Parry? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think if, if, if there wasn't gaps, then there wouldn't be an issue. Um, so, I, I, of course, that we've got um, points that we need to learn about. And I think particularly people with multiple and complex needs, we know that interventions need to combine uh, different approaches, particularly around anti-poverty measures, because even when we look at, we know the biggest cause of uh, homelessness is relationship breakdown, for example, but we know that um, there is different factors that, um, that contribute to that, uh, particularly anti-poverty measures, mental health support um, and money advice are all things that need to work better together. I know the committee is going to come on to the um, Housing First model but that is something that a few councils have looked at and have viewed very positively um, I think that would be really helpful in terms of both um, the last questions I think there's obviously a resource implication there that councils are aware of but are very keen to look at um, and I think Promise it's the very next question we're going to come on to is housing first. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and just on the last point on that is just around um, psychologically uh, informed environments um, and how much that can help positive incomes as, uh, outcomes as well. So I think, yeah, it's right to say that there are a few gaps there because if there wasn't, the system would be working and we wouldn't have homeless people. I think we know what they are. Um, and, you know, it's just sometimes about taking that uh, leap of faith to go forward with them and fund them. Can you tell us what they are? Well, I think the housing first option is, is something that uh, that we know we need to look at. And I think it comes back to the point about welfare reform as well. So, you know, we knew these things were coming, but we perhaps didn't plan for them particularly well enough. Again, I would say that comes back to resources and having uh, the ability of joined up thinking and people to sit down and take the time and, and work through these um, issues with a multi-agency approach. Community planning partnerships are doing that very well in local authorities. That's a model that's um, well integrated uh, across Scotland and it's something that's continuously been built on. So we're now seeing integrated joint boards working with housing, working with mental health, working with the Scottish Prison Service. But there's more people that need to come around that table. I mean, we, we're talking about welfare reform, but we've not really talked about DWP and their role in this and how they're working with local authorities. Now, I'm hopeful and, and certainly feel reassured that in the future, when some of those uh, issues are devolved to Scotland, that we might see a, a different relationship that's more positive and that involves local working but at the moment we've still got a long way to go to make sure that we can just keep the system running until we're able to do something different. Okay. Uh, Lorraine McGrath and Dr Burley want to give additional comments this Lorraine? Um, I think there are absolutely gaps um, and I think one of the, I would echo that um, across the country, I think one of the challenges that I see all the time in, in being able to respond is a lot of local authorities retract to their statutory duty, um, and that is is not the statutory duty is not enabling; it's disabling and within the system, particularly for people with the most extreme needs. Um, a really good examination of how local authorities can better manage their statutory, statutory duties, um, and actually work with frontline service partners, third sector commission mm -hmm. partners, to actually help them deliver their statutory duties rather than us having to pass a service user to the local authority in order for them to discharge the statutory duty and effectively them being then passed back to us to being able to have that direct access at the first point of contact, which will generally be a third sector organisation. You know, a crisis intervention um, will generally be a third sector organisation, but we then have to go through a process. Um, and it really is you, you know, it's been echoed already in the evidence that's been given. It's We take people in the most extreme circumstances of their lives and make it the most difficult for them to access services, whether that be engaged with a health response because they have to visit a building at a defined point in time. And if they don't do that, then they're not complying. They have to be in a particular state in order to be assessed for any particular <coughs> thing. They, um, and if they can't do that, then their situation's just rolled on. Um, they have to be able to engage with a, an online system for much of the housing access that we have across the country. Um, if they have no experience of that, of no skill with that, or no no ability to concentrate for any short period, period of time, never mind the length of time it takes. Um, if they are not able to go at that point in time and engage with a, housing, a, a homelessness access arrangement with the statutory sector, then they don't get the housing to homelessness response that they require. All of those things make it difficult for people 
at the worst point in their, their lives if their point of contact happens to be a street outreach support worker in any of the cities or a day centre in any of the cities, then it would be really powerful for that organisation to be able to do the work there and then with that individual and get them access to the services that they need without having to jump through a whole load of other hoops. So a real examination of how we can support local authorities to devolve that responsibility and not retract behind it in the way that they respond, no, you have to come, It has to, people have to go through this process so that we can discharge our statutory duty, I think would be really helpful. Hey, Dr Burley? Briefly, really, I think uh, mine's a slightly more abstract idea of GAP, but it, it echoes what I was saying before. It's something about uh, an integration and understanding of of what we are actually trying to do here. I think one of the things we, we've done is we've integrated, we do integration sort of horizontally. One of the things I think we forget about is a sort of more vertical integration where we, for example, would integrate some of our understandings about good, the good data we have from Harriet Watt University, for example, on adverse childhood experiences and all the material we have about that and how that relates to some of the symptomatic presentations that we try and deal with here, which are often become very disconnected in terms of our interventions from an actual understanding of how they have evolved and developed. So it's about how do we integrate across the board, vertically, horizontally, such that anybody who's working in this business has an understanding um, that can get them past the kind of diagnostic overshadowing that tends to happen when someone presents with a big symptom like, I'm homeless, or I use heroin, or I've got this problem here, and we can all get very involved with that symptom and start to become slightly amnesic about this person has come from somewhere. Okay, thank you. Kenny? I was just going to say, I mean, I know you're going on to housing first, so I'm not going to ask a question on that as other colleagues would, but I would just say that I know that Dr Burley has said it should be commissioned without delay, uh, um, that uh, Simon Community has said um, it provides the best sustainable outcomes. Uh, Turning Point has said it should be the default model of choice with those as multiple complex needs. And um, Housing First is an exciting model with a lot of potential, say, causeless. So an interesting discussion, I think, we're about to have. Uh, yes, absolutely. Now, I'm going to start off with some questions on Housing First. I know that uh, some of the committee members want to come in and, and ask about, about that as well. We said at the start of the session, the committee... Uh, had a visit to Helsinki to look at the finished housing first model. And we met with a variety of agencies and people. We met with uh, Mayor Vapavuri, who's the, the Mayor of Helsinki, who was the former housing minister there. And he took the view that, um, get basically he said, uh, get a nameplate on a door, give people a permanent tenancy, and give them all the supports they need, and do it at the first instance, rather than jump through lots of hoops. So the explanation he gave of the previous process in Finland was someone may appear uh, as a rough sleeper in Helsinki or another city, they may get into an emergency hostel on a take your chance on a nightly basis and then they may get a more stable hostel and then they may go get some form of temporary accommodation and then they may get some form of long term temporary accommodation and then they may get a permanent tenancy and of course all those hoops the individual had to jump through never really happened. So Housing First was about at that first opportunity where people were presenting with multiple and complex needs as a rough sleeper, even if they were in recovery from alcohol addiction, eh, significant and complex mental health needs, eh, in recovery from other substance addictions or offend, dealing with offending behaviour, was very quickly get the permanent tenancy and wrap support around them in the first instance. And their statistics showed that there was a dramatic increase in the health and well-being and the tenancy retention of those individuals. It was a significant financial investment. And I'm very conscious that uh, Patrick Mackay is here from Turning Point Scotland, who in a very small scale for one section of a homeless uh, and vulnerable community has been modelling some of that work. So of course, and I'm very keen to hear what, what your experience has been, but I suppose a key question should be in the witnesses' understanding of housing first. It's not just a housing first, it's housing and everything else first. Because one of the things they did in Finland is they, they, they employed 300 plus additional support workers, whether that was of a medical discipline or social work discipline, or actually an individual with a cross-cutting expertise to support individuals. Now, it wasn't a silver bullet, and we'll come on and look at some of the issues with Housing First in a moment as well, but that sets the scene of what I think the committee discovered 
in Finland and we'd be quite keen to hear the initial comments from Mr Mackay and how Turning Point have uh, managed Housing First and what your experience has been as well as some initial comments from the other witnesses. So, Mr Mackay. Um, it, it, it's interesting because I've also been to Helsinki and looked at the Housing First model there, which is certainly a, an interesting model. And, and I think that it, it reflects a lot of what we've learned and what we've been doing within our first and most mature Housing First service, which is in Glasgow. We've been operating since 2011. But almost the thing you have to say first for me is that it's about understanding a system, everything that we've already said, which is a staircase model, which makes people have to demonstrate that they can live independently and that they're housing ready. And I've worked in homelessness for nearly 30 years, and I know that there are a whole group of individuals, whether we describe them as multiple complex needs or whatever, that there are a group of individuals who that system fails. So what Housing First does and what we have did is to take those people who actually sometimes aren't in recovery, who are still intravenously using, and we are giving them a house. But the key part to that is we're wrapping the right level of support around them. And there are specific components that have to be within that support, I believe, to make it work. One is you have to have regularity of contact. It has to be assertive. So, for example, some of the stuff we've touched on is how do rough sleepers engage with, for example, a choice-based letting housing initiative? They can, it's too difficult. So what we have to ensure is that we go out and that we're meeting people where they're at, if it's their begging sites, if they're sofa surfing, if it's where they pick up their prescription for methadone. So we go and meet people where they are and we take them through that whole journey of housing. And another, I think, a key element that works for us, there's some research that says that without it, Housing First still works, but I think a peer support worker, where we employ people as support workers who have got lived experience, it's that is overt within their job title, and I think that they bring a different level of authenticity and authority to the relationship, which I think can genuinely be transforming for people, and there can be a contagion of hope around recovery. One of the things that Harriet Watt um, showed within the research of our Glasgow Housing First Service was that even though we are not telling people to give up substances, the very fact that you give people a house, they do give up. And suddenly a, a quarter of the people within the cohort they looked at went into recovery, they stopped using. And there's basic things that just having a house achieves. You know, having a registered address to have a GP for the first time, which gives you access to all kinds of other services. So f for Turning Point Scotland, um, although we accept that, that, that well, that, that there's, a, there's a magic number which is often used, which is 80-20. Our belief is that 80% of provision should be in a housing first basis, but that 20% you will always need to have some kind of person-centred response to people who have got complex needs. So you do have some supported accommodation. I think that should be direct access and should be emergency based. And I also think it should be pie. It should be psychologically informed. So if you have fewer services that are supported accommodation, in them, you then spend more money to make them better. And before I take Dr Burley in, just, just for the public record, a specific client group that you're dealing yeah, with? Yeah, so, so our client group was, we'd, I mean, if you look at housing farms across the world, it's often people who have complex mental health, but our client group are people who have got substance misuse issues. But remember everything else that we've said, I think they're the same client group. Those guys that we're working with all have complex trauma, have been diagnosed, many of them with personality disorder, hate that label but that's the label it's given um, the, these are they're, they're very very similar groups but what it did make it challenging for us and there are specific issues in Glasgow because it's a stock transfer local authority we were having to go to RSLs and say listen we have individuals who are who are intravenous drug users going to give us houses for them that can be a hard sell as you might imagine but for some RSLs they did come on board with us in particular note to GHA to Thenu and to Queen's Cross Housing Association who ran a pilot with us and, the, and that pilot once it became demonstratable allowed and the success is demonstratable it allowed other RSLs to buy into it. Tenancy in these situations. So it's a secure tenancy, it's Scottish secure tenancy yeah. given given to the tenant. And yeah. if you look at those, those key principles of housing first, and one of them is you separate out housing from support. So even if somebody was to lose that tenancy, the support that we would give them would continue. And in the five years we've had one eviction 
talking about a very complex group with one full eviction. We've had three people also who we have supported to give up their tenancies because it's a better option for them rather than going into rent areas because things were failing. But the rest of the individuals have sustained tenancies or moved on successfully, you know, maybe met somebody just need a bigger house. But um, we the, the, the failure rate is very, very low. I hate the word failure, sorry. It, yes, I, I understand. Yeah, um, Dr Burley? So you just say it's, it's worth uh, uh, reminding ourselves that Housing First uh, was really developed from a sort of moral and ideological perspective rather than a theoretical one. But by merry happen chance, I think the reason it works is because theoretically it's very sound and makes a lot of sense and is by accident perhaps psychologically informed. Uh, Winnicott in the 50s came up with a profound idea that home is where we start from. Um, and I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that that is actually the case. In terms of the population we're talking about, what we know, again, what we know with a reasonably capital K, is that this is a population whose start in life was not good. Um, and so they, range, they present with a range of symptoms, as, as Patrick said, be that homelessness, drug use, mental health problems, whatever it might be. And we keep trying to address those things without addressing what is the fundamental ailment that has led the person to develop these symptoms in the first place. And often is, where did they start from? And I think what Housing First aims to address is not a restart, but to provide something that has been absent, to say, here is a secure base, which you do not need to worry about, it is there. Because often what we do in housing, well, in homelessness, I think, is, is a bit like, I don't know if and many of you have children, be like bringing up your children in your own home and every day saying to them, you do know that this won't last forever. And then expecting them to do well at school and be able to focus on friendships and develop and, and grow. We do a lot of that in homeless services. We expect people to address high-end things like drug use, mental health problems, while at the same time saying, you do know the ground beneath your feet isn't going to be there, like tomorrow and the next day or in a month's time, as opposed to saying, here's a secure base. Here's something that you can attach to and is going not going away and you can be confident is around. And then even when you engage with it in quite an ambivalent way and are in and out about it, we will not give up. We will hold this line and say, here is something you can rely upon. And then in time, once that becomes internalised, the person may then be able to address uh, other bits and bobs. So for me, my, uh, my sort of uh, belief in housing first is, one, the evidence base shows it's very good, but actually from a theoretical point of view, it's incredibly sound. And I think that's probably why it works. OK, thank you. Lydia McGrath? Yeah, um, I think everything that's been said is absolutely, and your experience in, in Helsinki, I'm sure, endorses the, the value of the model. Um, I think one of the things that we need to be mindful of in Scotland is that issue about the 20%, um, and that 20% don't need to be excluded from Housing First, in, in, our, in our view. It's, it's more about the models of Housing First um, that we apply in Scotland to the context. Um, and we do have a lot of really good quality supported accommodation buildings and environments out there. Why can that not be permanent housing? Why can we not recognise that that person has a long-term support need in the way that we do for mental health, physical disabilities, learning disabilities, older people? We don't consider people who are long-term supported in their home in any of those other care groups as homeless. Why can we not apply that same methodology to people who have come through the homelessness route but who also have complex needs and see them in the context of their complex needs that will require long-term support mm. but they may not or cannot cope, may not want to live on their own in a flat but regardless of the level of support around them or they cannot cope with that for whatever reason at this stage in their lives but why can they not still have a permanent home? and not be regarded as homeless anymore, but within a supported environment. In the way that exactly that they've done in Helsinki, where they've flipped models from being supported hostels into um, permanent tenancies, but within a supported environment. Tease that out a little more. I'm going to give Dr Burley and then Andy White, you can take the question forward from here, because I know there's other stuff you want to raise. Now, that was one of the, the eye-openers for the committee in Helsinki, where it sat uncomfortable, just general chat, we've got no considered opinion on this, uh, this yet, but it's that a little bit uncomfortable with the committee, the idea of adapting host, host, former hostels into 80 studio flats in the one place 
and community living. We weren't sure whether that was a model that would or wouldn't work in Scotland and would, would that just re-entrench a hostel system um, that there seemed much more limited use of scattered housing uh, in Finland. So if, if you go for the studio apartment, how do you then move on from that? What's your pathway into another permanent tenancy else within the city or the country if that's what you want? So it, it just upped a little bit. We, we, we weren't sure whether or not that would be appropriate uh, for Scotland. So I'm interested to hear you say, Lorraine, that that might that that kind of community living might have a value. So I'd be interested a little bit more about that. Not for the majority of people. For the majority of people, we would always seek to um, uh, support their aspiration to have a home in the community on their own. Um, but for those, taking, again, taking a very personalised approach, for those who don't feel able to take that step or don't want to take that step, there has to be an alternative because the only other thing that happens to that person is that they remain stuck in the homeless system and they bounce about various emergency models rather than saying, right, this is my permanent place. The, all the points that Adam made about this is my home and I am safe and I'm secure here. I, I, don't, I don't need to be talked... You don't need to talk to me on a daily basis of your moving on plan, your forward plan, we need to start talking about housing. This is my home and I feel comfortable here and I know what I want and I know that I'm supported effectively and within a peer group. Um, it's not necessarily congregate living. Thankfully, we don't have many um, hostels of those kind of sizes in, in Scotland, so we would be talking much more small scale um, in terms of 8, 10, 15. But there is a real opportunity there to meet a need for that 20% or some of that 20% that will not sustain a traditional housing first model within a flat in a community on their own. Really interesting, and, and the examples we saw in Helsinki did appear to work, so we am just trying whether that would transpose to Scotland or not, and what, what they were saying to us was, do your housing first model that's suitable for your circumstances rather than you know, lift and shift was, was the message we were getting. Patrick Mackay, did you want to come in? It's on? a very interesting area and it's a very contentious area and lots of people that work in Housing First have different views around it, um, whether you should congregate versus disperse, which is sometimes described as a pathway model, and then you have a thing called Housing First Light, just to really confuse you. But in terms of Helsinki, it, it was interesting because I, I also went to see a model which was described as Housing First, and I think there's very good Housing First models within Helsinki, but when you started to tease out, we met some service users there, um, and and when and there were still service users, interestingly, and um, and we were taken in to look at people's rooms, which I never went because I'm not terribly comfortable doing that. But th th there was something still very temporary about it. For them, there was still an expectation that some of them moved on in that instance. But I think that Lorraine is maybe making a different point, and I don't disagree with it, in which you, you can have smaller models um, of congregate living which people have greater security of tenure. And interestingly, Samson Meris, who's the architect of Housing First, would, would say that as well. He, he would agree with that. But for me, the default model must always be that people are given a house. And it's even if it's not Housing First, it's housing-led. Now, within that, and it's only because there are a group of individuals who, when there's a perception of support, they're always put into this staircase model in which they have to demonstrate, and we have to stop doing that. Well, Councillor Parry, then Dr Burley, and then we'll come back to Andy Whiteman after that. So, Councillor Parry. Uh, yeah, just uh, very briefly picking up some of those points um, from a local authority point of view, I'd certainly uh, agree with Mr Mackay around um, not only to have the the physical housing there, but also the wraparound uh, support as well. Very much from a local authority level, we know that we need to take a multi-agency uh, approach, but that doesn't mean to say that every single agency has to go and visit one person. In fact, sometimes uh, that has a detrimental effect. So I think it's about finding the right people uh, to, to work with people to get the right outcomes, um, but not necessarily in a way that creates duplication because um, we know that that has uh, not only a resource impact, but an impact on that person as well. Um, and secondly, from the point, uh, the very pragmatic point of view um, around housing options, um, I know we've not talked a lot about housing supply, but obviously housing supply um, is an issue, but I think we need to have a real debate around um, what new houses look like. Local authorities at the moment are uh, changing the way that they're building houses. Um, in the recent um, 
ship plans that came forward from local authorities, they were looking at um, more houses for single people, um, supported accommodation, what that means for um, our more elderly residents. But I think we need to have a real debate around the types of uh, properties that we have available for homeless housing. What, what is the shape of that and what kind of materials it would look like? We need to have a very pragmatic conversation about that and make sure that we build in flexibilities to funding as well. So at the moment, local authorities uh, have a very prescriptive type of funding for the type of housing that they build. Um, so that's something that the committee might want to explore further as well. Thank you. And SHIP plan, strategic housing investment plan, just not everyone watching will necessarily Sorry. know what SHIPs we're referring to. Dr Burley, thanks for your patience. Yeah, it's okay, fine. Uh, two quick points. They're, they're both on the, on the theme of understanding, really. Um, one, I think uh, you talked about some of the resistances to potential. I think one of those is an idea which we still... Uh, labour under at times within the population I'm referring to about choices, that we have good housing systems, we could have good mental health systems, and then there's this group of people who just make choices. They choose not to engage, they choose not to do this, they choose not to do X, Y, and Z. It's just simply not true. It's articulated far better uh, by Suzanne Fitzpatrick, for example, in a recent paper. She's talking about, we know what the variables are. P the people who we are talking about have not chosen their childhoods. They did not choose their development. They did not choose where they were born or how their mind was formed any more than they choose how and in what, what degree of repertoire they have to engage with the current sort of systems. So that's, I think, something that needs to be borne in mind because I still think there's a cultural idea the person who's sitting on Southbridge begging is kind of choosing to do that in some way and he's just not really engaging with the proliferation of services that we've made available. I think the second point is, um, is again, a slightly pedantic one, but I think quite an important one. I, I come from a profession that's very uh, interested in, in coming up with quite discrete models and then really inhabiting them for quite long periods of time. And I think there's nothing quite like a discrete model to exclude people. And I think there's a risk with something like Housing First. It becomes a brand and a model and there's a, um, there's a manual about how you do it and then we can tour it around the country and make money about it. I think the, the broader sort of definition would be something like as I say, being psychologically informed, of which Housing First is an example of one. But there are many examples of one based on good, sound, evidence-based theory about what has happened here, what is our understanding, and can we develop a service that is informed by that understanding. In some cases, it might look like Housing First, as was originally described. In some cases, it might look like something very, very different. We've run pilot uh, um, cases in Edinburgh that have been very much modified versions of what might be called Housing First, but it's been incredibly effective and incredibly money-saving as well as human misery-saving. Thank you very much. Andy Whiteman? Uh, thank you, Convener. We've covered a bit, of, a bit of the ground there. I mean, one of the things I noted um, from Finland looking at their action plan for 2016-17 were, were the costs. So the cost estimate for their plan for 2016-17 was 78 million euros. That's broken down into 54 million um, of investment, um, service development of 24 uh, million euros. I mean, for a country of 5 million, that's, those are not big numbers. Um, and I think I'm correct in saying the Scottish Government, when it announced its short life working group for rough sleeping, was talking about a budget of 50 million over the life remaining lifetime of this parliament. So we're talking about sums of money that are in very much the same ballpark and are not huge sums of money um, relative to other things we spend money on. We also heard, and I think we've yet to receive possibly and read, um, some work that had been done uh, in Tampere in Finland, looking at the cost benefits, the fact that if you spend this money, you are saving also some substantial sums of money in public services that are designed around the traditional approaches that in themselves cost money. So I just wonder if you give some kind of sense of your own understanding about the cost implications and the cost benefits of a housing first approach to substantially eliminating homelessness in Scotland. Okay, Patrick Mackay, okay. followed by Dr. Burley. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's it's important to to be clear that the group that we're talking about within Housing First 
are often people who will use services for a long time anyway. So, so the, the idea that, and it is important that you don't have a finite time with the support, that it has to be ongoing. And I know that can make commissioners nervous, but what we would say is that that support would be picked up in some other way by some other silo of funding. So we have to be open to that. In terms of savings, I mean, a basic saving, like the example I gave you about um, or provided in terms of people being registered with a GP. Neil Hamlet, public health doctor, will often talk about the graph that he shows people, and it's about who uses acute services. And it's, it's people who are older, and it's people who have complex need. So just by registering somebody with a doctor, you know, I'm not saying they will never use acute services, but you will see a diminishment of that. And that in itself, that saving, it definitely, you know, will, will, will exist and will happen. I think sometimes with cost-benefit analysis, analysis, some of the challenges are that the, the, the people who are commissioning you are, might not be the people who feel the saving. And, that, and that, that becomes a challenge in your argument. But again, it goes back to Christy for me. If you return to the idea that we should stop being so siloed, that, you know, and accept that that saving will be to the public purse and not to one silo within the public purse. I mean, really, what, what Patrick said, the, the, the case exam, the, the pilot studies we've done, were actually, in book two of those cases, they didn't actually register with the GP. But in terms of the basic security that was seemed to be provided by the accommodation and our formulation, some of what how the person was using things like, for example, regularly calling a Scotch ambulance service, regular attending A&E in ways that they would call inappropriate and were very high cost, regularly using the criminal justice service would be ways of getting involved with people in a sort of ambivalent type of relationship. The, the, the intervention that we provided seemed to address that to the point where on all of those points, hospital admission, ambulance call-outs, A&E attendance, t days in prison, days in hospital, days in court, all dropped. And that's before you even get into the human cost of, well, the number of days he was rough sleeping dropped to al almost zero. You know, and this was somebody whose longest period in accommodation was six to eight weeks maximum. And then suddenly we, suddenly we were able to house him for 34 months. And in that 34 months, everything drops to, he's still drink. he's still got lots of problems. I mean, this isn't some kind of, oh, he's all better and become a tax-paying individual. That's not really what's happened. But he's certainly secure. And we might, if we did it for long enough, things might, might have changed. Ultimately, that came to an end because it was a pilot project. Um, but at least carries the potential for some kind of psychological development because you have got the fundamentals in of a secure base from which other things uh, c could potentially grow from. It also just diminishes the risk that he's going to be found dead in a graveyard. And if he is going to die, at least he, he dies in a place where someone will find him the next morning and he's safe and warm. That's very helpful. Uh, I don't know if others wish to come right. in. Nicola Dickey. I mean, I suppose from a from a causal perspective and, and picking up on the, the, the Christie point, everyone's all about um, breaking down silos, um, but we, we don't necessarily see the same um, um, willingness when we start to talk about preventative spend around about budgets. So I think the thing about it is everyone's all for breaking down those silos until it's, well, can you give us some of your budget to, to move into that preventative spending. I say that um, as a representative of local government who are just as, as bad as that. So I think we, we have to be aware that there's, a no, there's not an awful lot of money sloshing about in the system to, to, to move into this. And yes, we will see those benefits eventually. So I think we just have to have to be aware that we, we're not in a situation where we have you know, stuff that we can lift off the shelf to do this. Um, and, and I suppose it, it would be interesting to look at the model in Helsinki about how much they put in at the very start to actually stimulate that so that we started to get into that kind of type of preventative spend. So I think that it's just worth saying that. Well, that's certainly one of the arguments we would hear as well. The Scottish Ambulance Service aren't giving the housing department the money that they've saved on even just on these two individuals. That's not what's happening. Okay, now, just because of... Sorry, Andy, we want to come back in. Apologies. Yes, of course, of course. That, no, I just want to affirm that you make a very, very important point about preventative spending, and I don't think we in this place have yet grappled properly and come up with a solution about how you do that accounting and how those savings that the police might make that help the health service, how they in turn can 
uh, help local authorities, etc. That's a vital part of all of this. I just want, you know, just in conclusion on this, on my line of questioning here. I mean, we, we're going to have to make some recommendations on housing first, and it seems. Um, you know, there's one school of thought that this might be a useful thing and we could do a few pilots, and in a sense, I suppose, Patrick, you've been doing what might be described as a pilot. Uh, the other school of thought is the kind of finished one where you had very, very firm political leadership, where the man who's now the mayor of Helsinki was the housing minister. He embraced it. He faced significant political challenges, but he brought key constituencies along said, right, we're going to commit to this and commit to this wholeheartedly because we believe we can make big, big um, uh, uh, strides forward uh, through doing it. I mean, what would you, what would your sense be of the role of Housing First in eliminating substantially homelessness in Scotland? Is it something we should recommend government consider, or at the other end of the scale, is it something we should be recommending that they wholeheartedly adopt without, with very little caveats? Uh, Councillor Parry, followed by Patrick McKay. Uh, yeah, I would certainly uh, agree with the sentiments uh, looking at that. And I think that a mechanism that would be interesting perhaps for the committee to look at as a vehicle for that is community planning partnerships. And the benefit of those is that they, they are already uh, recognised and they're in existence. And they also provide that uh, locally um, democratic layer um, that perhaps um, is something that, that's a key element to what's happening in Helsinki. So it gives you the local uh, democratic element as well, which is perhaps... Um, from a causal point of view, uh, perhaps more important in terms of local flexibilities and the ability to be able to feed in uh, local priorities in terms of demographics and what those local issues look like, but having a consistent model in place uh, to do that from. Patrick McKay. I think that Scotland has some of the most robust homelessness legislation in the world and we recognise as having that. But I think that where we have fallen down a wee bit is in terms of advancing housing first. Now, I, I would say that, you know, that of course we have to be mindful that it, it doesn't dominate everything, that there's other ways. But I think that for it to, to be fully successful, there has to be a Scottish government commitment um, to actually creating the mechanisms that allow local authorities to scale up housing first at a significant level. Dr. Burley? I think really just to, to put in, to echo that, I mean, it strikes me, theoretically it makes sense. Economically, it seems to potentially make sense. Evidence based wise, when it's been done elsewhere, it makes sense. So then my question is, well, what are the resistances to it? And that strikes me that those are some of the more ideological ideas about, about why we might not try and provide this sort of level of care for this group of people. Um, but with the, the only caveat I think I would want to put in is something about the kind of restriction on it as a discrete idea of housing first looks like this. It has this, 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 and this, and that's it. And if it's not that, well, then you're not true to model and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. I think something where you have the description where you're talking about theoretically evidence-based informed interventions of which housing first happens to be an example is a much better way of describing it to sort of say what we want to do is commit to providing into commissioning services that have an evidence base and that are theoretically sound, of which Housing First is an example. But as I say, they're an, a very good example because it really addresses some of the very fundaments of what it is to be, to, 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 be, to, to be able to develop as a human being. But there is going to be examples for particular individuals where you may have to tweak around the edges based on what that individual sort of case is. So I think it'd be a commitment to the fundamentals and then freedom for services to be able to tweak around the edges for particular individuals. Hey, Lenny McGrath, do you want to add to that? Um, I would echo all three comments. I do think it needs to be um, something that Scotland embraces quite strongly, but on the basis of the principles of Housing First, not a defined model, because we do need to look at it both in the Scottish context and then the local context of each individual local authority, and then down to the individual person. And we need to marry the principles of Housing First alongside the, the national policy agenda around personalisation and self-directed support so that the, the, the adoption of the models are not just about this is what the evidence base tells us, although that's really important, but it's about what does this person need? What is going to work best for this person? And how do we create a network of responses that allows us to do that? for every single person that finds themselves in those extreme circumstances. OK, Dr Burley, before I bring in just a time check, um, hoping to, we've got other witnesses waiting for the next session, hoping to finish this around quarter past 11. Apologies to those that are 
that, that, that are waiting. We've got a couple of questions want to mop up. I think the final question will be from our Deputy Commissioner Elaine Smith, who will talk a little more about the hearing now, the hearing now for us looping in homelessness and what's actually happening just now. But we'll, we'll, we'll just mop up one or two things before we close the evidence session. Dr Burley, you wanted to add something? Very quickly, there? I just want to articulate very clearly why the point I made is important. One, one of the things that's really problematic for the population we work with is, is exclusion. They are excluded repeatedly from places and one of the reasons one of the things that holds an exclusion together is discretion of intervention discretion of service all the sorts of boundaries that we put in place the risk of saying right we have housing first is as soon as you put two boundaries in like that you start to exclude and that is the fundamental thing that gets in the way of the people we work with getting care is exclusion thank you it's worth putting on the record that, that when we were in helsinki it was noted that you know, Helsinki, Finland developed housing first in isolation from New York, who also developed a, a very different housing first model. So there's underlying principles rather than efficacy to one lift and shift model. And I think that's that, that's come through very strongly from the witnesses. It should be set in a Scottish context with some underlying principles. But there is, of course, a short life expert group uh, the Scottish Government has, has started just now. And there are some budget lines around that as well. So £10 million a year ending homelessness together budget line and a £20 million a year alcohol and drug services budget line, one of the underlying drivers towards homelessness and rough sleeping as well. So I do want to finish with the Deputy Convener talking about the here and now of homelessness. But given the fact that the Short Life Expert Group is currently meeting, um, any comments in relation to that? And not just those budget lines, but of course there's the affordable housing budget line more, more generally and how that's going to be used. And then we'll finish off with that, that final line of questioning. Any thoughts in relation to the working group or or budgets? Just your oppor you don't have to. Any an opportunity for you though, Lorraine McGrath? Well, I suppose as the only member of the working group here, um, I, th I think the challenge that we face is the, the the same challenges that we're talking about um, around this around this room is that how do we integrate a response into a system that is designed around a different population that's designed around the kind of general population rather than the discrete needs of the of the people that that we have caught up in homelessness in Scotland just now so we're we're bumping against those um, issues already and although there's additional resources there that doesn't necessarily address the system change that's required. Um, and that's going to be one of the big challenges. And that's where the cut across to those other programme for government priorities is going to prove really important. That's helpful. Don't feel the need to, to respond to that question. It's an opportunity if you want to, though. Uh, Nicola Dickey. I mean, I think from a, from a COSLA perspective, we recognise that the interventions that have been made around about the action group are, are over time and that we're coming into winter and there's some very specific things that the group have been set up to do. So I think um, fundamentally we, we recognise that. Um, we would go back to the point that we were looking for strategic interventions, though. So the action group does what the action group does, but we make sure that the conversations that need to be had are, are, are already um, taken forward and that we continue to feed that sort of stuff in. So I think we recognise the action group are doing something specific. In the longer term, we're looking for those strategic discussions to continue around about the governance structures we already have. OK, that, that's very helpful. Elaine Smith. Thanks, Convener. Um, rather than the here and now of homelessness, it's more specifically about the type of homelessness that is rough sleeping. Um, and I have a specific question for the Simon community. It's just if Lorraine McGrath could explain slightly in more detail about the the reasons that you've given in your written submission about why you think rough sleeping is more visible now? Um, in, t in Glasgow in particular? Well, um, I, yeah. if you're referring to Glasgow in your yeah, written submission. It's, it's predominantly in Glasgow. There is a perception of um, an increase in rough sleeping within the public, but there is also um, a reality that the people that, that are predominantly on the streets are all been known to services for a long time um, and there's a range of indicators that tell us what that's about and a lot of it is about their personal safety um, but it's also a big part of it is public generosity um, and compassionate responses from charitable groups where people are able to find themselves sustaining a lifestyle um, that is known and comfortable for them. It's not necessarily a choice. It's something that's become, this is what I do, this is where I am at. And also um, public giving is supporting that to some degree. For some, 
um, and that will preclude someone, it's particularly for those who are heavily entrenched in addiction, where the addiction is driving their behaviours, they will, they will choose that opportunity to receive public giving over accessing services. Talking about there is um, people who are rough sleeping who have begging pictures, as you put it yeah. in your response, yeah. because not all people who are begging are, are homeless. As, we, as no, it was noted elsewhere. No, we do we do a, um, an audit of the street begging population in, in Glasgow every three months, um, so we have a really good um, level of intelligence around who the street beggars are and what their circumstances are. Okay, only about a third of them are are actively in the most extreme homeless circumstances. Um, the vast majority are there for other reasons of desperation. They are, okay. you know, um, that vary across the board. But for that third, who are also rough sleepers, um, a big part of what keeps them in that situation, for many, is that opportunity. Because for many of them, they will not have an active benefit claim. They will not have active engagement with statutory services. Um, but they will have an active engage uh, an active addiction that is driving their daily behaviours, um, okay. um, and that's a really difficult thing to yeah. to break when the opportunity is there. I mean, we heard a, we heard yesterday about a, a young girl um, that we have managed um, who's moved into to temporary accommodation, but she would talk about you know trying to sit and do a benefit claim for her took hours because of the complexity of her situation. And while she was sitting there, she was saying to the member of staff, I can see my pound coins walking past, my regular givers walking past. You know, I'm, I, I, and, and I need that money. I need mm -hmm. that money because I'm now starting to feel a, a desperate need to feed my addiction. Okay. So that's it's, the challenge that the yeah. staff face, and that's one of the difficulties that we've got in the how difficult the system is to navigate for people. Yeah. Because it's really difficult for her to get from that situation where she's able to sit and receive money from the public and feed her addiction, to quickly transition from that into a place where she's got her benefits in place, she has a, a settled place to call home, um, and she's got access to the health and addiction services that she needs. Thanks. The, the journey she's got to navigate from there to there is so problematic yeah. that it's much easier for her to just stay there and, mm. and, and talk to her regular givers every day. Thanks very much. Is that audit information you have something that you could share with us? Yes. Thank you. Can I then go on to asking um, another specific question around that to both yourself, Lorraine McGrath, and to Dr Burley, based on the submissions? Um, you indicate that, um, that you, you said in your response there that public and charitable initiatives are, are enabling people to sustain life on the streets, but Dr Burley and his uh, contribution also notes that actually churches, for example, are the ones that are showing a good model of um, housing for the most entrenched homeless, providing basically night shelters, specifically in Edinburgh and Glasgow. So I suppose what I want to ask about that is, um, what are your views on the available support for rough sleepers? Is there a need for more temporary accommodation? I mean, I know that we moved away from that sort of model, but actually right now is is there a need for looking at some of the unintended consequences that might have occurred from policy decisions in the past if i use the example of the people that we've been working through the can initiative um and again even just talking about that young woman that i've just referenced she's been in and out of temporary accommodation over the over many years she's also rough slept for long periods of time mm -hmm. um the emergency temporary accommodation never ever worked for her. It failed, broke down very, very quickly. Um, she's now in a temporary furnished flat, which is still temporary accommodation, but she sees it as a house. She sees it as a as a as a home. We were able to try that which is not ordinary. We don't ordinarily transition people from rough sleeping street into a temporary furnished flat. There's usually a you know, a few steps in between. And I suppose if anything this endorses the, the idea of a housing a housing first approach. They're settled. She's she's living with a partner. They're much more settled now. Um, she's engaging with health service. She's engaging with with responses. As is her partner. You know, there's been some wobbles. This is the first time that that's happened for her. Um, that she's been able to go straight into a flat, without without staircase and in, in and out of emergency and, and and temporary accommodation. It is still temporary because it's a temporary furnished flat in Glasgow, but. It's a home. 
rather than a than a room somewhere. So, do we need more temporary accommodation? Right this very second, probably yes, in terms of just quantity and quality uh, quantity. But is that the solution for people like that young woman? Then no, I don't think it is. I think it is being able to transition her to somewhere where that she can call home, whatever home looks like for her, as quickly as possible, and getting the support in place for her. Um, in relation to winter night shelters um, that are operated both uh, here in Edinburgh and in Glasgow, it's not just about the shelter, it's about what goes with that shelter. Having someone come into the winter night shelter from rough sleeping is a real opportunity. Um, and we've worked really hard in Glasgow in the last few years to really build up the service response that goes with the opportunity for people to have that let's say, place of safety overnight so that services are in reaching so that we are we are there every night and we're there every morning to make sure that as many people are transitioned out of that, the need for winter night shelter as quickly as possible. And that's proven really successful. So um, one of the things that the action group is looking at is whether or not we need to ramp up winter night shelter provision this year, but very much in the context of how do we do that, but making sure that there's a massive service response around that as well, because it's not just about having a place of safety overnight, it's an opportunity to affect change in that person's life as well. Specifically ask Dr Burley on that, that um, you say in your submission that uh, provide good basic low threshold shelter for those who need it, so could you maybe expand on what you mean by that? What I mean by that is um, I think uh, again from a sort of psychological understanding point of view, one of the things that um, ambivalence leads you towards as service providers is, is oxymorons like trying to provide permanent temporary accommodation, uh, things like that, and, and trying to actually provide something that addresses and understands the psychological and emotional needs of the population you're trying to serve. I think what, what we call night shelters can do is allow people who are deeply ambivalent about attachment to be both in and out. So they can both have somewhere where they can be in, but know that they can also leave very quickly. And so it's not permanent, which might evoke a very sort of uh, claustrophobic response, but it's not completely absent, which then might evoke a quite agrophobic response. And we are talking about people who have very big agrophobic, claustrophobic crises, where when they're attached to people, they feel very distressed, and when they're detached from people, they feel very distressed. So I think what night shelters can do, or that sort of accommodation can do, is provide one step in a developmental pathway towards, I guess, what we might understand as being healthy attachment, where we can do things like form relationships with people and houses and jobs, etc., in a way that feels anxiety-free and secure and allows us to develop as human beings and the rest of it. So I, I would understand the provision of shelter like that as being part of this broad spectrum that we talked about that might come under psychologically informed. I would still say it's a housing first type approach where you're saying what we are going to provide for you is an accommodation that you can make use of and at least is sympathetic or based upon our understanding or our discussed understanding with you about where you are developmentally, what your psychological needs are. It's not to say that it should just then become a dumping ground, because as I think Lorraine articulates, it's how we find and position ourselves in relation to people. And I think there can be a real skill that care staff are very good at doing, at sort of looking at people out the corner of one's eye, so as not to sort of scare them off by going, right, let's do lots of work and really address your issues, which can make people run to the hills, and at the same time not just kind of going, oh, they're just no hopers, there's no point in doing anything with them, and just giving up on them, but trying to find some balance where you can exist in the ambivalence and remain interested in people who both attract your attention and uh, disable it. And I think, as I say, I think night shelters, I think the only reason, my, my experience is the only resistance to things like night shelters is an ideological one of, oh, we just don't like that idea. On that, can then I ask you my final question, I suppose, convener, if you don't mind, is that at the moment in Glasgow and Edinburgh, it is the churches that are providing this accommodation, church, mainly church groups providing this accommodation. So is it appropriate? Well, so that's obviously much needed and, and they're doing a, a, a good service. Is it appropriate that it's charitable institutions, it's charity, if you like, that's providing that or should the state be doing it? Can I say, I mean, as I say, from a, from a health point of view, I think it's reasonably scandalous. If you look at, if you thought about 
the consequence of adversity being a massive uh, difficulty in being able to trust and make relationships with other human beings, which I said is the fundament that might allow us to do things like get jobs, live, and all that, and have good health, then the ailment of, have, of having that is a fundamental health problem. And one of the consequences of that is to, for example, in some cases, to be jobless, homeless, relationshipless, and street living. That is a bit, that's a health problem. And the health intervention there is the provision of some kind of shelter that might allow the person to start developing a trusting relationship with, with, a, with a, a human object in some way. So I think fundamentally it should be. It's worth reminding ourselves the average age of death at the Edinburgh Access Practice over the last uh, five years was 42 it's a, a really life-limiting condition to not be able to form and maintain human relationships. It really, really is. And I think something like the provision of, of shelter like that, if we could get our heads around it and our understanding around it, we could think about that as a fundamental health intervention that was being as part of our health and social care canon. Lady McGrath, I think, wants to add something. <laughs> I would endorse an awful lot of what Adam's saying. I, I think if there's a state response, I would probably like to see that um, much more on the basis of a return to an opportunity for people to have direct access to accommodation mm -hmm. without having to jump through the hoops, which endorses all the principles that Adam's talking about there in terms of people being able to opt in and opt out on the basis of what their um, experience allows them to cope with. We don't have that in any of, uh, of the major cities at the moment, um, and that I think that would be an important part of new provision or a change in provision is, or even to test that out this winter if we possibly could in either of the major cities to look at what can we change if we can have low threshold services that people don't have to jump through any hoops they don't have to get any hoops to get accommodated that night they just they're there they engage with street outreach and they're able to be connected with it and they can leave the next day without consequence mm -hmm. and come back again that next night have for however many times they need to do that before they have built up enough trust and engagement with the staff there or with the staff that work um, in and around that service. So that's a bit more structured, I suppose, than looking at more winter night shelters of, frankly, mattresses on floors yeah. um, in, in, a, in a shared space. Um, if we were able to, to look at some direct access and arrangements for some of the accommodation that we've already have and to be able to use that um, much more flexibly on a basis of personal choice rather than engagement with the system, then I think I think would certainly support that. Okay, final final comment from Councillor Parry, but even if it's the most interesting thing in the world, Councillor Parry, no other witnesses I'm afraid can come in at this point. We're going to have to close the evidence session, right? So no pressure then, uh, Councillor Parry. Uh, thanks, Camino. I'll make it very brief. And it's just to urge some caution to the committee around um, thinking about uh, rough sleeping as only a city centre problem. Of course it's not. So we do need to think about a strategic approach, um, but also think about local issues, because we know that people will go from a local authority in a rural area to, uh, to a centre in Glasgow or Edinburgh as well. So just to consider that in the strategic approach. Thank you. OK, well, it just remains for myself to thank all our witnesses for what is an extensive and rewarding for the MSPs anyway evidence session this morning. Uh, please continue to follow our, in our inquiry. If there's any additional comments you want to make, email the clerks, contact ourselves, and we can, we can, we can get that, that, that fed into us. But thank you very much, and uh, no doubt this, this will continue. Can we suspend briefly? Uh, to allow the new, uh, our next witness panel uh, to take their seats. We'll spend for a couple of minutes. Thanks.
Thank you, and I uh, reconvene this meeting of the committee. And we are still on item two with our second panel who have joined us. And thank you very much for your patience as we have taken a little bit more time to get here than we had thought that we would. Um, our panel are Joe Connolly, Criminal Justice Voluntary Sector Forum, Paul Brown, Chief Executive Legal Services Agency, Nikki Brown, Homelessness and Housing Support Senior Manager, City of Edinburgh Council, and Jamie Stewart, Housing Development Officer, Scottish Refugee Council. Um, before I ask you to make an opening statement, if you wish, as I understand most of you do, can I welcome you to the committee? Thank you for coming and also put on record an apology from our convener who has had to leave as the conveners group are meeting with the First Minister shortly. Um, so can we start, please, with Joe Connolly with a short opening statement? OK. Um, um, Joe Connolly from... I'm representing the, the Criminal Justice Voluntary Sector Forum, but I'm a Chief Executive of Why People as well. So, but, and the Criminal Justice Voluntary Sector Forum is a, is a collaborative group of voluntary organisations. It consists of 31 organisations who have come together you know, and, uh, with a view to, to working as collaboratively as, as possible in terms of addressing uh, with local authorities and, and, and the Scottish Government some of the issues around. But I just want to just, just highlight some of the key messages we've given and, and, and uh, in our, our response. Um, and what, what we, we identify is there's a gap between legislation and imp implementation. And one of the things I was struck with when, when I read the, the full response from, from, from our, our, our group was how disparate the serv there are lots and lots of things happening across the country, but they're pretty disparate. And so, it, you, the type of service you receive depended on which part of the country you were living in. I also identified imprisonment as an important risk factor for why people become homeless, and that doesn't not only for the prisoner. You know, um, homelessness it can hit the families when they're left they, to, to 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 fend on their own. They they, they they can end up running into rent arrears, and, and um, um, there's a clear link between homelessness and reoffending. Um, and we as a third sector, we believe that we have a critical role to play in terms of service delivery, working with statutory bodies in terms of not only just providing accommodation, but providing support as well. Um, the accommodation offered, and I, I can spe certainly speak for my organisation, that has to be of the highest standard in, in, in terms of, you know, it, it's not, we, 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 we don't throw mattresses on a floor, we, 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 we people who will come out of, of prison will walk into a nice decorated flat and, and with, with all the amenities and, and things like that without, without wraparound support around it. Prevention is the key, and I think, and, and especially when people arrive in prison, almost from the day they arrive, you know the day they're going to leave. So you can start to actually work towards a plan that says uh, identifying if there are issues of homelessness as well as other issues for them. And, and, and put, put that plan in, in, into action. Um, and I suppose last but not least, I mean, consideration has to be given with regards to the, the, the impact of welfare reform. I was talking to one of my managers yesterday and they described it as a kind of general shambles in terms of, and, and, and some of the work, some of the things they're having to disentangle through the, the, this new welfare reform or universal credit, etc. So. So that's that, that's that, that's. I just wanted to summarise the the, the the position of, of, of the forum. Thank you, Mr. Conley. I'm sure some of my colleagues will wish to pick up some of those points. Um, could I invite Paul Brown just before I do? I could also say thank you as we did visit um, the Legal Services Agency as part of our pre approach to this whole inquiry. So thank you for that. We enjoyed the visit, <laughs> much, much appreciated. I'm here to represent the Legal Service Agency, but I'm also a member of the Campaign for Housing and Social Welfare Law Reform, which is a sort of flexible umbrella body, but the proposals, points that I'm making, have been discussed with quite a number of people. Um, I think our position, broadly speaking, is that home, Scottish homelessness legislation has rightly been praised as a model of good practice. Um, the same can't be said, however, for its implementation, that, to reflect what's just been said, there's a, there's a disparity between principles and practices. We haven't um, taken on board the consequences of unintended, the unintended consequences of a variety of changes, and I think this is a real welcome opportunity to look at some of those. The major change that um, we see as having happened is the effect of stock transfer in many local authority areas 
The local authority has the duty, but not the means to carry out their duties. Local, authority need, local authorities need access to RSL stock. Um, that doesn't seem to work often. Don't know why, I'm not in a position to comment on that. That's a separate issue. But I can, I think, say that the legal basis for local authority referrals to RSLs is weak. Section 5 of the 2001 Act is, if you like, controlled by Section 6, which provides for an arbitration process, but that's cumbersome, weak, and so far as I'm aware, never been used. If it has been used, hardly ever. It doesn't seem to be the right sort of legal relationship. The arrangements were based on, another, on, the, on the requirements of another era. Um, the other issue, and I think it's been a theme that we've heard throughout the, the evidence that, the, the, to, that I've heard today is that homeless people have no direct voice um, and it's not surprising that key issues get out of date. The most obvious is the Code of Guidance. It was published in 2005. It no me makes no mention of a whole load of issues. It doesn't mention equalities law. It doesn't mention people with no recourse to public funds. My friends here will comment in on that. It doesn't discuss in detail the issues about temporary accommodation and the exorbitant level of charges that are often made. It doesn't discuss the major difficulties of accessing temporary accommodation and our experience in providing advice, assistance, and representation is that lots of people have difficulty accessing the most basic temporary accommodation, even though there's a clear legal obligation to provide it. Um, the Code of Guidance doesn't adequately address the issues about um, the speed, the the low, the, the, the low speed with which permanent accommodation is often offered. Someone was just telling me this morning about a case where the, the client in a perfectly ordinary circumstances has been in temporary accommodation for well over 32 weeks. That's just a wee example. Um, the Code of Guidance also includes a section on the now abolished priority need concept. It's a key document. It should be updated. Obviously, a fair amount of work, but a worthwhile one. And in terms of cost savings, if you've got everything all in the one place, you can give it to people and say, read this, and you'll understand it. You can't say that to anybody at the moment because it's completely misleading on a number of important points. But it is an important document. Once updated, Section 37 of the 2001 Act should be amended to provide that local authorities be required to not merely have regard to it, but to comply with it. At the moment, there's local authorities, insofar as it just gives guidance, do not need to comply with it. The, once it's updated, that obligation needs to be tightened. Um, I think we also need to discuss further prevention of homeless services. Um, research has clearly shown most, homeless, most homelessness is caused by factors that are out of the control of the people affected by it. We've heard very clear, articulate evidence to that effect. We need to quash this idea that it's a lifestyle choice. I, we've, I've heard that articulated on numerous occasions. You never hear people at, at conferences saying, oh, homelessness is a lifestyle choice. Let's discuss this strange lifestyle. But people say it. That needs to be quashed. That needs to be recognized. Um, we, we need to ensure that everyone's given a second or third chance and op also appropriate support. And I think we need to look outside the box about what the appropriate support is. Support at the right time saves a lot of money. We've discussed that again today, so there's a very strong theme. How to save money. A stitch in time doesn't save 10, 100, but tens of thousands, if not millions. One um, preventative service that just popped up in discussion recently is the Seattle Rent Assistance Program, where forbearance is given to people with rent arrears to stop them becoming homeless, and the program pays off rent arrears, either in whole or part, as part of a structured rights and money-based, money advice-based procedure. The upstream preventative me measures have been documented by the voluntary organizations concerned as to save large amounts of money. I think that's an experiment that we need to look at, 
and you know, I'm volunteering to go off to Seattle to find out more if you're interested. But in actual fact, there is an academic working in Edinburgh who has worked on that program, so you can get information about these sorts of things really easily. And I, I you, in, under the new private rented sector regime, people will be threatened with eviction and possibly lose their houses for really quite small levels of rent arrears. So maybe partly through charitable giving and partly through, through a government program, I'm not small amounts of money might make a really big difference to stop the unnecessary homelessness sometimes well it's always unnecessary but to, to take one or two steps that could quite easily be taken that would make a really big difference so thanks very much it's mr brown um nikki brown has indicated you will just wait for questioning and could mr jamie stewart make a short if possible opening statement i will try uh thanks for the opportunity um First, let me say I'm here as a representative of Scottish Refugee Council, but I also am a member of the Campaign for Housing and Social Welfare Law and have had discussions about this uh, in the past with colleagues in that group. Um, to be clear, if I could, I'd like to talk both about asylum seekers and refugees who find themselves homeless, although recognising that due to the intricacies of devolved reserve matters, public funds, that maybe the the, the solutions are not, not necessarily be the same. Um, I also um, appreciate that provisions do exist within Scotland that seek to accommodate both asylum seekers and refugees. However, as we've submitted in our written evidence, homelessness is built into the refugee experience. Uh, for asylum seekers, this is the fact. This is due to the fact that accommodation relies upon a hugely imperfect system um, of recognising of a person's status, um, and this was recognised by the Scottish Parliament's Equalities and Human Rights Commission in the Hidden Right Lives Report, which was published earlier this year, um, which stated it's clear that uh, the asylum and immigration system is peppered with points. As direct quote, at which the risk of destitution becomes likely and the sheer complexity and inaccessibility of the process makes it unnecessarily difficult in practical terms for someone new to the UK who is destitute to initiate the process. An example of this is our destitution advice service, which we deliver in partnership with Refugee Survival Trust. Uh, over 2016-17, 191 people were seen through that service um, as destitute and the impact of the mental and physical health of destitution during the asylum process is considerable. And our conversations with street teams around Scotland uh, suggest that there are significant numbers of people who are labelled under the broad rubric of no recourse to public funds, which includes um, asylum seekers or destitute, EEA nationals, people with some other insecure um, immigration status. And councils are struggling to know what entitles, if any, entitlements, if any, exist for these people, and that we believe that something needs to be um, done to, to concertedly um, put people back into, uh, into services that are available. When individuals are granted the legal status in the UK, people are asked to leave their accommodation, and our evidence under a holistic integration service suggests that at least 85% of refugees are dealt with through the homeless system, um, many of whom are unable to access homeless assistance at the point of at which they need, um, uh, leading to large amounts of sofa surfing and, um, and other types of homelessness. Those lucky enough to access homeless accommodation face lengthy stays in hostels, hotels and temporary flats, waiting often over 32 weeks um, for uh, accommodation. We do work very closely, particularly with Glasgow City Council being the only um, dispersal area in, Gla in, in Scotland, to seek solutions to this issue and last year achieved an agreement to work on a system for allocating settled housing early in the process. However, a year on, um, there's been little change on the ground, so I think more needs to be done to make um, these statutory services work better in practice and for these reasons we made a number of recommendations but to have it for, for the committee to consider looking at the recommendations of the Hidden, Hidden Lives report and introduce more safeguards into the system around destitution um, and no provision of accommodation including making uh, a proactive approach to ensuring people currently considered no recourse to public funds are properly assessed and where, pop, pop, where possible delivered back into available support systems for them and as much as possible ensuring that homelessness is not 
um, as in the Hidden Lives report, um, built into the asylum process, learning from... I've you just, better I will not have time for yep, questions. Then. Learning from local authorities' experience in Syrian resettlement. I echo the robustness of Section 5 and the um, provisions of advice, advocacy and support, particularly around the introduction of statutory integration services for uh, refugees um, who, are, who are new in, into the... Um, into the country. Thank you very much. I mean, I think that's perhaps something for the committee to to say to witnesses. You know, you have given us written submissions, and the committee do assiduously read those, and they will want to tease out some of it with questions. So, whilst short opening statements are welcome, I think what what most of you have done is maybe cover quite a lot of what the committee wanted to ask. So, hopefully, uh, the question session might be a little bit shorter. Um, can I call first of all, Graham Simpson? Yeah, I've got a very quick question, and uh, apologies, I'm going to have to shoot off to the, to the same meeting as the convener, so um, it's not because I'm bored by, by what you've got to say. I genuinely have to go. So it's about um, housing options. Um, how do you think it could Im be improved, and do you think it should be given statutory backing? Can I here for that? In fact, I'll go to Nicky Brown first, since you haven't made an opening statement. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think certainly in terms of the way that housing options um, has been rolled out through the country, what you'll see is a, um, a reduction in homeless presentation, certainly in Edinburgh. I think there's probably a couple of things related to it. The first thing is, in order to have a, a, a true housing options approach, um, what we need to be sure is that uh, we're maximising people's income. Because very much your housing options are determined by the amount of money that you have and that you have to spend. And what we'll have in Edinburgh at the moment is an acute shortage of affordable housing. So whilst, we're, whilst we are... Um, managing to reduce homeless pre presentation significantly. The, the knock-on effect of that is once people become homeless, and I think one of the, the previous panel, Lorraine McGrath, talked about this, we're preventing homelessness where it is preventable by using a housing options approach and by working together. But actually, when people come into the homeless system, because of there's such an acute shortage of affordable housing in the city, whether it be um, social housing or private rented housing, it's incredibly difficult to move people into settled and sustained Housing. So people's housing options are very much determined about um, what's available in the city and how much money they have. So one of the key things we want to do in Edinburgh is ensure that from the point of presentation for either housing advice or, or homeless assessment, throughout the case management we're including employability support, we're including um, welfare benefits maximisation support, and that we're constantly reviewing people's circumstances in order to make sure they've got up-to-date housing options advice that will assist them in moving on to settled and sustained accommodation as quickly as possible. But notwithstanding that, within the changes to the welfare reform landscape, and a unique position, or maybe not unique, but the, the certain specific circumstances in Edinburgh in terms of the affordability of housing, that is incredibly challenging. Thank you very much. Would anyone else wish to add a brief comment, Mr Conley? Yeah. I, I think um, in the answer, the first answer is, can it be improved? Yes. But I think where it works, it works. It can work well. I've, I've, we've had some good and bad examples of it in terms of if the options, if there, if there are an assessment of need is, is, is carried out properly and, and the options are there and the positive options are there and there is dialogue between the, 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 um, the council who, 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 who are, and, and some of the providers in terms of what, what options are around you can place. And we, we've had some, in terms of criminal justice, we had a great example of um, one a service in, in East, East Kilbride which works with people with complex needs and somebody was sent to prison and they would normally lose their, their tenancy at that point. It was an outreach, it's an outreach part of the service. Um, well, I've actually visited that project um, myself, and uh, it is uh, hugely impressive. So yeah. Just, just to say that. Thank you, thank you for, thank you for that. Um, it's good, it's good to hear. Um, but, but so, so they, we, we, we did some work with the council, with, 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 with the local authority, and, and we were able to sustain that tenancy while the person was in prison. The person came out, and they're, they're doing very well. So it was a good an example of if, if it works, it can work well. But some of the examples given here around sleeping bags and things like that, they're true examples, you know, so that, that's, where, that's where it falls down. But I think it is a positive, and as I say, we, we, in general terms, I, we, we've had some very, very good experiences with it. Thank you. Do you want to come in with a further question? Because I genuinely have to leave, but others may. Thank you. Well, perhaps I could just ask um, Mr Brown, actually Paul Brown, um, if... From what you said before, do you think that um, the legislative framework needs to be amended to give housing options some kind of statutory footing? Well, at the moment, the 
many of the obligations that local authorities have are not implemented, or if they are, they're implemented very slowly. So um, I'm not altogether sure quite sort of what sort of statutory footing housing options could be given that would change that fundamental difficulty. There's chronic problems that need to be addressed. Um, the advantage of having a separate set of homelessness obligations is that you can use those to cut through any procedures or whatever it is that housing options may provide for. So I would be concerned that making housing, putting housing options onto a statutory footing would water down the already, well, the, the admirable principles that we have. I'd like to see those being implemented and those being implemented fully. We, we've heard about, um, well, there are, I think there are unintended consequences. Uh, you know, the, the crisis of temporary accommodation wasn't planned. It was a, probably a good idea in lots of ways to close hostels, but the knock-on effect um, hasn't been thought of. And I think one of the witnesses was effectively saying that some people need hostels, and that's fair enough. I don't think, a, when changes happen, I don't think there is a broad enough debate. We don't have enough people coming along and interrogating them, possibly in a confrontive way, but that needs to be done. That hasn't been done, and we need to do that. Temporary accommodation is a major crisis. My impression is that trans is people who get into temporary accommodation then get log, log jammed there, and I think that was some of the evidence from Edinburgh. We to temporary yeah. accommodation, Mr. Brown, so can I ask you to hold sure, that yes, thought yes, on that one, please? <laughs> Thank you. Can I turn to uh, my colleague Alexander Stewart, who wishes to ask specifically about ex-prisoners? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you, thank you, Deputy Convener. Uh, Mr. Connell, you touched on in your opening remarks about the, the complexities, uh, uh, but you know when there's an expected date for someone who leaves uh, at the custodial sentence, uh, so you can plan in advance. Uh, and my, my question would be that, you know, uh, how can we tra challenge and tackle that risk of that individual becoming homeless? Uh, because if everything is put in place for them as they vacate uh, that institution, uh, then it should be easy uh, for individuals to, to process that. Uh, so, you know, you've touched on what has taken place, but there must be some real best practice taking place across the sector uh, that has reduced that in some shape, way and form. There are, there are examples of it, but as I say it's, it's pretty disparate across across the country. Um, we, I can give you an example. We're part of the um, the, the the public uh, social partnership in Low Moss with, with um, Turning Point, Action for Children, Sacro. Well, we we provide accommodation. We provide temporary the temporary accommodation and the wraparound support for people, you know, c coming out of, of of the prison. But that starts within the prison, that starts, the planning starts, and then on the day of, of release, the, the prisoners met coming out and is taken around wherever they need to go to, and then to their flat, which is fully furnished and, 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 and everything's in place. And that support continues for, for, for a period. And we've actually got examples, and it, and it kind of fits into the, a version of the, 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 the Housing First model, where We've been, people have been able to negotiate to keep the accommodation. They become settled in an area, and if they come to and they say we would like to keep this, we will we, we will we will do that. We will try. We will negotiate with the. It's usually GHA or, or, or Cube Housing in Glasgow. We will negotiate and we will get another property. And so 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 so, so that's, a, that's an example of the good practice. One of the things that I don't know is my is my speaker on. Is it, yeah. Um, one of the things. Um, I was at a, 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 a seminar in Parliament recently, and the frustration around the room of through care officers, the whole range of, 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 of providers of services who were saying there are lots of resources around, but structurally it breaks down. If, if, when, when the person comes out, if they're, they're left to their own devices, when they come out, it breaks down very, very quickly, and, and quite often people reoffend and, and, and end up back in prison. The, the whole idea of this joint working uh, and the, the, the new model of the local community justice planning uh, gives us the opportunity to have that, that joined up approach. Uh, and and you've, you've highlighted that if there is that joined up approach, then, then that can become a success. It's when the joined up approach doesn't take place uh, or the, the, 
uh, the individual feels isolated uh, or, 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 or doesn't have the connections with the community, that that then falls apart. So, so you know, you've, you've talked about the good practice that's taking place in, in specific areas, but that there has to be more bad practice in reality because it isn't happening across the piece. Uh, and what should we do to ensure that it is going to happen across the piece? Well, as I say, structurally it breaks down. And I'll give you an example. I phoned um, one of our services today who provide that type of accommodation. I said, we, we, we've, we have um, 16 flats just now for, for people who have, uh, are coming through the prison system. We've got five uh, women's bail flats as well, and that's in partnership with Aberlour and Turning Point. So I said, well, what's our, our position just now? Only 11 of the, of the flats are occupied. There are five vacancies in the, in, in, in the, 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 the service that provides the, the accommodation for Lomas, and there were two vacancies for, for, for the women's bail. Now, the, those vacancies for women's bail, they're, they're ring-fenced, so the people, and again, people move on to, to various other types of accommodation and back with families and things. <laughs> so that's an example of... It breaks down because... It, it comes into a structure where bureaucracy, and I think uh, Lorraine McGrath mentioned some of it today around, you know, she, she was talking about uh, uh, when, when people go to uh, a, an aid shelter, it, if you were providing something much better, you would need to take the complication away of the hoops that people have to go through. Reduce the number of hoops and, 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 and we'll have a, a much more fluid system. And I think that this is very similar in terms of people come out there's been examples of people coming out of of prison, bad bad practice, and going to the the, the the housing office and being told, you have to go into a hostel. The person saying, if I go into a hostel, I'll offend over the weekend. It's only a hostel that's available, and the person goes into the, into a hostel. So the, the, the ex offender themselves has a lack of confidence with the system that they are that they are given uh, or the support that they are. Uh, provided with uh, when they get to that stage, because you just say you've, you've, you've chosen an example there that just highlights and identifies uh, how it's easier sometimes for the individual to go back into the uh, offending situation uh, than it is for them to go through the hoops that they're having to do to make sure they can get a, a, a accommodation that is that is of a reasonable standard for them. Yeah, I think it's more than more than just a lack of confidence. Could you answer briefly, Mr. Brown would like in as well. Right, I think it's more than just a lack of confidence. Another example I can give is a, this is when somebody was met at the prison gate and brought to the various offices and, and the person fainted later that day with exhaustion because of the various things that they had to do in terms of the, 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 their benefits and various... They went from pillar to post. Now, that was with support. This, this person collapsed with exhaustion. So it's a rigorous process when somebody comes out and even with the support... It, 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 it can be difficult. Thank you. I just wanted to say briefly that I um, have experienced some of the stuff you're talking about in the past with people coming out looking for temporary accommodation following being uh, being liberated from prison. What we've tried to do in Edinburgh is now is make sure that many of the things you're talking about, about the arrangement of temporary accommodation or the sorting out of people's benefits or, or the housing options that we need to give to people if they can't maintain the tenancy when they go into prison is something that we're actively doing. So there is obviously good practice there. Um, and as I would say, I mean, we'd be happy to speak to anybody about the measures that we've put in place to ensure that the, the transfer is as seamless as possible. So, yes, they may have to go to a housing office um, to be allocated that accommodation. And sometimes it will be on what's available on the day, but the earlier notice and the, I suppose, the earlier intervention work we can do when people are in prison, then um, it makes it a much more seamless process at the end. Thanks very much. That um, actually, I think, leads us into uh, a discussion around temporary accommodation and I know that Andy Whiteman wants to specifically pick up on some of the City of Edinburgh issues so if I could call my colleague Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much um, convener. <clears throat> um, yes I mean the council's, Edinburgh Council's own submission notes the increase in uh, temporary accommodation of 21% in the last year um, and recent media reports about the increased numbers of B&Bs that have been bought on a rather urgent basis. What, why, why has the pressure on temporary accommodation increased so significantly in Edinburgh? In recent years, actually, in line with the, the pressure on temporary accommodation services um, increasing, the actual number of people presenting as homeless in Edinburgh is going down. So less people are coming in. Um, you, you'll see from the submission there that um, the, the major contributing factor um, in terms of the increased pressure on temporary accommodation services actually an increased length of stay for people. So homelessness case lengths are extending. 
Um, and if I was to sum it up quite simply, um, it would back to the, the point I made previously, there's such an acute shortage of affordable housing in Edinburgh that for anybody who's welfare dependent um, or on a low income, it's incredibly difficult to have any other options other than social rented housing, of which there aren't enough, which is why the, the council's looking to build um, a significant number of homes over the next five years. But in answer to your question, the reason the pressure on temporary accommodation is so significant at the moment, and the reason that we're using bed and breakfast, as, as outlined in the newspaper article that I'm sure you've seen, um, is simply that people are staying longer. We're not getting the opportunity to discharge your, your duties to people by giving them an offer of either permanent or settled housing, <coughs> and then more people will come in each day. And is that part of a longer-term trend within a falling homelessness population? For Edinburgh, it certainly is. Average, sorry, average length of stays have increased consistently and significantly. There's been a spike probably in the last, I don't know the figures there, but probably in the last three to four years, but it's consistently average length of stay have been increasing. Thank you, Mr. Yep. And so in terms of other members of the panel, I mean, we've heard some evidence in the previous panel about temporary accommodation, the standards of temporary accommodation, um, etc. Um, and there's been calls for improvements in standards of temporary accommodation. Do you think that's a, a worthwhile call or do you think that that's just um, underpinning what is a, a bit of a sticking plaster in a wider problem which is a shortage of full-time permanent accommodation? I think Mr. Brown would, uh, Paul Brown would like to come in here. Our experience bluntly is having difficulty access, accessing it for clients. We get sometimes up to 10, at the moment it's five to seven people a week who just don't, are not being offered temporary accommodation and we ha have to threaten judicial review, very rarely actually have to uh, undertake it. So that's the, the fundamental problem. The other fundamental problem is, apart from the time people often end up staying in it, is the cost, which is horrendous, which makes it unaffordable for people who are working. And that is a major problem, and it's due to the local authority concerns not implementing the form of words used in the code of guidance about how temporary accommodation charges are supposed to be worked out so those are the sort of fundamental uh, issues that i mean there's a hierarchy of needs getting the accommodation would then lead into concern about overcrowding and all sorts of difficulties but that's the fundamental crisis if i could just make one other brief comment about the prisoners issues i would simply say that benefit payments while people in prison towards the rent is is a major issue and one issue about assisting prisoners would be to extend possibly on a discretionary basis the length of time that benefits well basically housing benefit can be paid for i think that would make a significant difference for some people i mean we the, there is however a major problem no question about that about prisoners coming out of prison and being expected to deal with everything all at once including finding somewhere to stay and it's very difficult to manage. I would share that concern. So if that 20% or 30% of the weight of that need to, pr to pr make provision can be reduced by more generous benefit payments, again, I'm sure that would save a very large amount of money. Mr Stewart, do you want to come in? Yes, just wanted to echo, or just the echo the points about um, accessing temporary accommodation, long terms of temporary accommodation cost. Um, however, the way in which the Glasgow Mayor primarily uh, focused on Glasgow, the way in which it's uh, often presented to us in, Gla in Glasgow is that uh, supply is not an issue, um, that there are homes there um, and that the issue has been getting people from uh, temporary accommodation through the system and into uh, onto the uh, onto uh, settled accommodation, um, and for me, a lot of that um, surrounds around the process of assessment. We've had the uh, sort of comments about psychologically informed and understanding the needs and expectations and aspirations of people, um, and that that's sort of more fundamental in the context that we're in. But what that the comment which uh, Nikki gave about Edinburgh and it, what it what it reflects is a, is a is, is a quite a lot of dis difference between uh, local authorities, um, in, uh, in particular as to as to how we approach the issue of temporary accommodation and the drivers of why people are in temporary accommodation. Yeah, Mr. Whiteman, I think you have a specific question for Paul Brown of the LSA. Yes, just to follow up, I mean, you made a point about litigation. I think you said in your evidence you're considering strategic litigation in relationship to equalities legislation um, 
around the needs of people with protected characteristics and their access to temporary accommodation. Um, do you want to say something a little bit, I mean, briefly, what is strategic about that litigation? Well, I suppose there's two things. First of all, well, it relates to the Code of Guidance, which has not been updated to uh, help local authorities and anybody else interested in working out how to manage people with um, major mental health disabilities, for example, or other protected characteristics. The Code of Guidance doesn't explain how to manage that. So there is a tendency for people whose presenting problems are very difficult, for them and for providers, to have difficulty accessing services. I mean, that's sometimes fairly obvious that they're going to have difficulty accessing services. Um, they get affected by the same uh, appraisal of intentionality, possibly to some extent, even if only informally, as other people do, even though intentionality doesn't come into it. They're unable to manage the difficulties they have. So the reasonable adjustments are often not provided, and it would be, I'm not, obviously sometimes they are. I mean, I don't want to suggest local authorities and the voluntary organisations are doing their best. There's no question about that. They work hard. But on occasion, the reasonable adjustments that need to be made are not made. The thing that's strategic about using equalities uh, legislation is it is possible to claim compensation, and I think that's an important way of accountability. If somebody does is discriminated against unintentionally, indirectly, normally, um, but if they are, it is possible to claim um, compensation for that, and I think that's a useful way of focusing on the fact that action needs to be taken. Um, we are also going to use freedom of information requests to look into how systematic the approach is to various people with protected characteristics and well, we, we may find out, we haven't done it yet, we may find out there's a systematic failure in which case that would result in a, a strategic approach to litigation. I mean, it's at early stages yet but the experience is that the system has not fully adjusted to the, its overall commitment to taking on board the need to make reasonable adjustments for all the circumstances of everybody concerned, and the system doesn't do that. I mean, just a wee point about housing options, filling in forms, going online and all that sort of stuff, some people cannot possibly do that. It makes them too anxious, or they don't have the skills, or possibly both. A reasonable adjustments would entail saying to somebody, Here's a house. We don't need to. You don't need to get references. Don't need to have a bank account. Here's a house. Everything else will get sorted out for you, like it was done in the olden days. Now people are expected to jump through a whole range of hoops that, even if they in theory could overcome, in practice they can't. Getting references and all that sort of stuff. The idea that people are going to be moving into the private sector is, I'd have said, fairly naive. Um, keeping people in the private sector who have problems, who need a bit of help paying off the rent or whatever, I think is an important one. My suspicion, however, is that we are not going to solve the problem we're all wanting to address today without there being more provision of, of, of socially rented housing. I can't see that as, as, as being, any, any, that there being any other option. That would be my... And given yes. time constraints, I could maybe turn to my colleague Jenny Goldruth, I think, wants to explore some of that a bit further. Thank you, convener, and good afternoon to the panel. Um, in your written submission, uh, Paul Brown, um, you flag shelters evidence of a 24% increase in terms of evictions over the past year. And you say that social security austerity includes issues such as the benefit cap, sanctions, housing benefit reform, and cuts to disability benefits. And, and likewise, Nikki Brown, in your submission from Edinburgh Council, you talk about the implementation of welfare reform as expected. It currently could potentially cause significant financial pressures on temporary accommodation. With that in mind, we've already heard this morning, uh, both from COSLA and from the Simon community, about the impact of welfare reforms on homelessness more broadly. So I'd just like to ask what the panel's views are. And specifically, does the panel believe that these uh, welfare reforms are having a direct impact on uh, specific groups? Um, so, for example, women or care experienced young people, to single those two groups out? Could I ask Nikki Brown to come in first on that question? Certainly in terms of the, 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 the general landscape, then... It, 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 what seems to be all research out there will tell you that um, whenever, a, whenever a major 
welfare reform changes like universal credit have taken, uh, taken place in some areas, rent arrears have increased. Uh, if rent arrears are increasing um, within a local authority boundaries, I, I would suggest that some of those people inevitably um, will end up coming through a homelessness route. So, uh, as a general point, I think that some of the welfare reform changes that have come out, there is enough evidence out there at the moment, and I know things are still getting rolled out and there's an opportunity to change them. But I think there's enough evidence to suggest that um, there is a likelihood that more people will become homeless and that will directly have an impact on temporary accommodation services. In terms of the provision of temporary accommodation services, it's clearly challenging and expensive to provide temporary accommodation services at the moment for most local authorities, certainly in Edinburgh. And as welfare reform changes are rolled out further, and as less money is available to people to pay for that accommodation, then it is again inevitable that local authorities are going to have to take some of the hit there, and that and their budgets are going to be significantly impacted on by the impacts of welfare reform, whether it be the benefit cap, LHA rates or universal credit. And all of the evidence that we've heard from, from today, um, from the earlier panel and this panel, suggests that we should be looking at how do we provide greater standards of service for people, or greater accommodation options for people, or better standards of accommodation for people. And that is a challenge that local authorities face at the moment. That if welfare reform is going to significantly impact on the ability to either collect income or actually income that's available, how do, we, how do we bridge that gap? And I know that um, in terms of the creation of the National Task Force and then the fund, there is going to be an opportunity there, presumably for either third sector partners or local authorities, to pilot schemes that could be either more affordable or provide better options for people. But I'd like to see some detail on that because it, it would appear to me that the gap that we're going to have in Edinburgh in terms of, the, um, in terms of funding created by all manner of welfare reform is so significant that it will be incredibly difficult and challenging for us to deliver services. Mr Stewart, do you want to comment on the welfare reform issue? Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the six-week universal credit delay um, thing, although not um, introduced in Glasgow yet, will in introduce further barriers to lots of different groups, including uh, ref refugees. They're all new benefit claimants. They'll need to wait for their four-week waiting period and then, and, and then mo moving on. When thinking about the option of uh, or whether you're considering whether private rented sector is an option for for people who uh, already have the barrier of not having a national insurance number not having uh, the, the the orientation the language skills and the understanding putting in place a welfare benefit barrier where you're effectively not entitled to your payments until six weeks down the line creates a further barrier to doing any of that quite apart from setting people up to fail as has been sort of indicated towards there that people start with rent arrears, they start with in a in, in, in a bad place in relation to but it has specific impact. Welfare reform has specific impact on on the, the different groups and certainly within within the refugee population you've got work, uh, universal credit at the start it also limits the housing options available through uh, we have now cu coming up the um, we've currently got the what's called being called the bedroom tax which limits the number of bedrooms that someone is able to move into so limits the throughput uh, to where to where people are able to move to um, as of 2019 we'll have uh, caps on the uh, the the local housing allowance maxima so anyone under 30 uh, under 35 will be will only be able to access in Glasgow 68 pounds to pay for their their their, their rent 68 pounds a week the, a lot of accommodation is much more expensive than that even in the social rented sector um, those are only sort of two examples of where the where welfare reform stands in the way of moving people into and 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 effectively stands at odds to what I think we all want to do um, in terms of uh, alleviating homelessness. Conley, do you wish to make any comment on this specific yeah, issue? I'd echo what Jamie says, but we, we, why people actually provide, um, we provide temporary accommodation for, and we have, for, for a number of the, the, the people there, uh, specified exemptions, so, so they haven't been impacted at this stage. But where there has been impact is in larger families where, where they uh, kind of pass the benefit cap. And the, 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 there's a pressure in terms of larger families being being being, being, being housed in terms in terms of that. That's been that, that's been the biggest problem that we that we've encountered at this stage. Just Mr. Brown. Um, I I can share all the concerns that other people have mentioned. I, my impression is that RSLs and other housing providers will have more problems with rent arrears. They will then become more assertive 
um, the shelter figure is, 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 is masks another set of problems, which is that our experience has been that the number of cases calling in court has gone up or a, a bit, but the assertiveness of the landlords when they're in court has increased substantially, which means that one has more proofs when people have to apply for legal aid, give evidence and so forth. That's very, very stressful. I'm talking about for the lawyers. It is a hell for the families who may be threatened with eviction. Often it can get sorted out, but who are threatened with eviction as a result of, for instance, rent arrears. We're talking about six week delay. Um, that, that is how that pans out is very worrying. How services will be able to cope with that is very worrying. So I, I mean, I suppose the fundamental problem with, with, with benefits reform is it's all based on stick not there's not enough support and it's based on a fantasy about some about the need to discipline a small number of people for whereas most of the people we're talking about need more support more help rather than yet another set of changes my experience of changes going through the system is it takes years for people to really understand them and it isn't just the the claimants but all their advisors they maybe need medical reports for something that there's another cost and difficulty about that be years before the system is smoothly settled in and all the unintended consequences have been um, dealt with so providers will need to be more nimble and then will need to be more opportunity for discussing the consequence of unintended consequences. We don't know what those will be, but it would be tragic indeed if, say, an unintended consequence is RSLs evicting or having more people jump before they're pushed in a way that I'm sure no RSL really wants to happen. So will there be ways out of that? That's why the Seattle program, I think, is very interesting to say, look, 500 quid will make all the difference. Save very large amounts of money. I, th I think we need to think outside the box and think about the aspects of maybe focusing generosity. We've heard about that. Maybe focusing generosity in a way that we know can be monitored and can really make a difference. Thank you. I think we'll be interested in having a look at that model as a committee. Jenny Gorris. Um, with regard to that, um, we've heard a lot about uh, people working in their silos in terms of homelessness and that being a barrier to people, I suppose, working in a more integrated approach. Um, Causal say that the current statutory framework does not encourage other agencies to support housing outcomes of those with complex needs. Um, so how can we get that better joined up working? Does, for example, the health and social care partnership model offer an opportunity there? Anyone wish to volunteer to start to answer that specific question? Mr. Bray, Nicky Bray. Just, just in terms of um, an example of what we are doing in Edinburgh at the moment, as uh, Adam Burley talked about it previously uh, around the access point and access practice he referenced, um, and what that is is essentially a, a, a building where NHS services, social work services, and housing services um, sit together. What we've established through some of the, the work through a group called Inclusive Edinburgh. Um, from our local authority is that what we'd like to do is find a way of integrating our services in a, a, a much more coherent manner that has, um, just exactly as was described, it has similar outcomes for people and not necessarily defined only by housing outcomes. W one of the things that we've looked at is that, you know, when you take an example of a case where somebody's presented for accommodation maybe 30 or 40 times within a year for various different accommodation, actually a successful outcome might be for them that with intervention of the right service, with the right relationship with them, that, that might reduce to five. And, here, and, that, and I think that the, the model that we are looking at with the, the Edinburgh Access Practice and the Access Point um, and integrating those services together but also with third sector partners is finding the, the right service that has the relationship with a person that can follow them through the service so there's no multiple pass-offs um, and then what we're not doing is all working to different um, goals. They're all aligned in the same way. It's actually about making life better for that person and getting that person into a position where they can sustain some form of accommodation. You've heard already from Lorraine McGrath about the, the different models of accommodation that we might look at as well. So I think it's absolutely key that as we move forward with, with, with integrate, the integration of services that we use examples like the access practice where what we're actually looking at is for a common set of outcomes that are um, person-centred and related to their personal circumstances rather than housing outcomes. So I think there is work going on in that area, but it still needs to be developed. Thanks very much. Uh, briefly, Mr Conley, if you don't mind. I suppose that an example of, sort of uh, you know, so, 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 some of the good practice that, that appears to be about is some of the co-production that's, that's taking place. Um, there's some models around the country and around, around the homelessness. There's one in Glasgow just now where 
Um, they're looking at co-production in, ter in ter moving away from uh, a, a kind of purchaser provider model, and it's about involving the, all the organisations. Uh, the, 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 there'll be a grouping of organisations with with the, the, the council in terms of how, how services are developed and commissioned, and that should actually. I mean, the, the, if, if the theory works, that should be a successful model in terms of breaking down some of, some of those silos. So, so there are examples around. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, we are quite tight for time, and there are other areas I know the committee want to explore, specifically drilling down to some of the kinds of homelessness people experience. So uh, I want to turn, if you don't mind, to rough sleeping, and I know that Andy Whiteman has some specific questions on that matter. Yes, thanks, um, convener. Um, uh, Edinburgh Council, in your submission, you talk about further work needed to require to identify rough sleeper profiles to better under respond to the needs of a rough sleeper. And we heard from uh, the previous witnesses about the importance of that. Um, what, what's the council doing to to, to achieve that? The council, well, um, in conjunction with uh, Serenians, Bethany and street work from you obviously heard from Lorraine earlier, uh, has instigated the, the first in a series of rough sleeping counts. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that you'll hear in Edinburgh that rough sleeping is increasing. Um, and actually what we wanted to do was drill down into that to see if it was increasing because the, the figures that show the number of people who come to present as homeless following a night of rough sleeping are actually falling. So th there's two ways of looking at that. Maybe they are falling and maybe the numbers are falling in Edinburgh or maybe there's a gap there in getting people who are rough sleeping into the services that are going to be most appropriate for them as well. So that was the reason that with our partners in Edinburgh we wanted to do a, a true rough sleeping count. And what I mean by a true rough sleeping count is that we go beyond counting people and actually we need to understand what support would be required and how we would best deliver that support. And actually, as we progress with a series of rough sleeping um, counts, I think what we need to be doing is there needs to be careful monitoring of if we manage to get people who are currently rough sleeping into services, what is working for them? But beyond that, if we count, if in subsequent counts the same person is there, I think we need to get some learning for that about why they're still rough sleeping um, as, the, as the counts go on or as time elapses. So I think there's... In terms of the council, we've got a clear commitment um, with our partners in Edinburgh that we want to minimise rough sleeping wherever possible, and the count's just the first stage of that, but there's an enormous amount of learning we need to get about how do we get people from rough sleeping into the services and what are the barriers that are there at the moment. For example, street work going to the care shelters that we talked about briefly earlier um, every morning. And what they will do is they will pick up people who are incredibly vulnerable or who may require a housing service, um, and they will provide advice for them in the morning. And that doesn't necessarily always translate to an increase in homeless presentations for people coming out of the shelter. And actually, that's what we would like to see. So in terms of an increase in homeless presentations, actually, if that is getting people from a really, really insecure um, set of circumstances where they're having to access care shelters or they're having to rough sleep, to me, that would be a benefit if our, if our homelessness presentations actually increase if we're managing to get to the people who require our services the most. So over the course of the winter, um, there is a, an enormous amount of um, support going into the care shelters for a variety of services, health services, GPs, district nurses, homelessness professionals will be in there, as well as support workers for various different agencies. Um, and that's all being coordinated by Bethany, who operate the shelters. So I think from this year, what we'll get is an enormous amount of learning about how we need to develop our services going going forward to take into account the, the needs of the people accessing the care shelters, but also the needs of the people who are no access in the care shelters, but that we're picking up in the rough sleeping counts. Do you want to come in specifically on um, rough sleeping with migrants and asylum seekers? Yes, I would, it was what I would, um, as I said in my, my initial presentation, was there, there is this sort of lump of people who are referred to as no recourse to public funds. And there are various different little bits and pieces of, of, of work that have been done, but no um, sort of, there's, 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 there's not a, a clear idea of. A, how many people have no recourse to public funds and are therefore uh, rough sleeping or uh, or otherwise homeless, and to take the next step, what the why? Why why are people um, uh, in this position? And because there are there are people who um, perhaps European Economic Area nationals who have uh, uh, who who perhaps have some. Um, Entitlements to mainstream housing accommodation. Some some may not. Uh, you have people with insecure immigration status. You have people who have been asylum seekers and are now destitute, etc. Um, 
and there's there's a need for local authorities to try and dig down and get the detail of why and how um, people uh, who are currently lumped in this no recourse to public funds. I apologise, I always keep doing the, uh, the the scare quotes because there are there 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 are a number of different groups of people. Um, ultimately, the solution that, that we have found in terms of uh, asylum seekers is through our destitute uh, asylum seeker advice service, where it is an advice service primarily to get people back into current structures uh, through the uh, Section 4 support, through, uh, through, the, the, um, uh, th through, through the Home Office. Um, uh, but the start point in that is the diagnosis. The start point in that is, uh, what is your status? What, uh, how, how can you regularise that status? What actions do you need to take? Or actually, are there limited options within current strategy provision? Then we can have a look at that and we can say, well, what, what, what can we do with that? Um, what that that work will need to have some some form of specialism in terms of immigration advice and we need to be careful about who provides that who gives that advice uh, in the diagnosis part of it someone would need to be at least level one uh, oisc uh, qualified office of the immigration security commission qualified uh, in order to make that assessment as to what to 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 uh, this controlled level of legal advice um, to make that assessment says you, you have this this legal status, and in the level one would give would give the uh, the ability for that person then to say you need to go there and signpost and do those things. Level two would would be able to provide more detailed legal advice on that. Um, but then that provision and and the destitute asylum seeker is level level one qualified. And that provision then allows that person to say, yes, you now have, for example, the ability to go and apply for Section 4 support uh, uh, through, through the asylum system, and you go, you go there, you make that application. Other parts of it, particularly the... Um, the holistic uh, assessment part of it that, that that we do allow people to access um, other parts of their you know to, to to look at how they can progress their lives and regularise their status and address health problems and um, all those sorts of things can all be packaged into that particular um, intervention as such. But there's I think a need for a much more proactive approach and a much more delineated way of work of working out who is who has recourse to public funds, who doesn't, and what does actually no recourse to public funds mean in the first place. Very much, Mr. Stewart. Can I bring Jenny Goldruth in at this point, please? Thank you, convener. This is a specific question for Paul Brown. Um, in your submission, you say that our observation is that the number of rough sleepers has soared. They are younger, and there appear to be many more young women than was previously the case. Uh, can you account for why that might be happening? Well, I think it's quite difficult. <laughs> there is. It is difficult for people to access temporary accommodation. There is no question about that. You can track that quite easily in our practice. I mean, we don't collect very sophisticated statistics, but you can track that quite easily because things change when the night shelters open in the winter. There's no doubt that the night shelters serve a very important function. Um, I don't know why the number of non-traditional rough sleepers has increased um, again that it changes but I would speculate that the uh, vulnerability of people in private sector rented sector accommodation changes some of the people have are people who have no recourse to public funds or think they are in that situation sometimes it's care leavers people with mental health problems um, my impression is the most vulnerable often do get services. I don't want to suggest the system's not working at all, but there is a need for uh, equalities legislation to be taken very seriously with, um, I think, housing management trainers talk about walking the walk, need to walk the walk for people in all these different situations. Um, having said that, I, d I don't want... Um, things seem to have eased. I don't think it's as bad as it was a year ago, and at least our experience. Um, but I suppose the the problem is that if no fundamental changes are made, one 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 worries that something will happen, and one doesn't know what it is, and the figures will soar again. At the moment, we are coping with the number of people who come to see us in terms of the limited bit that we do. We are coping, but in the past, we haven't been able to cope. We've had 
we've had to turn people away, which we don't want to do ever. Thank you, Mr. Brown. If possible, I want to have a quick discussion about housing first, but I'm conscious of time and we really do have to try and finish by about a quarter to two. So my colleague Kenneth Gibson has been patiently waiting. I'm going to call Mr. Gibson at this point. Right. Well, it wasn't to talk about housing first. It was to talk about, uh, obviously, the, the rights issue. Sorry, issues. I'm going to housing first, but I'm yeah, bringing sorry. you in first. <laughs> right, OK. Thank you very much. And um, it, one of the people we had giving evidence to is who was a, a, a former service user, Mr Thomas Lyon, who actually uh, was supported by legal uh, services agency and he said and I quote I spent six and a half years on the street in Glasgow I did every hostel three four or five times each I was never offered any temporary accommodation had to go to the legal services agency to get into a temporary furnished flat and he is now uh, uh, back in mainstream housing um, I'm just wondering um, uh, Mr Brown, Mr Paul Brown if you can um, maybe talk to us a wee bit about the uh, issue of rights and the, the, the inability of homeless people to access those rights simply because they don't even know those rights exist or what those rights might be. Well there's an issue about people not knowing where the rights are and where to go for them and we've made suggestions in, uh, in our submission about more systematic publicity um, um, requirement and that needs to be flexible because the situation changes and it needs to be focused on the problems that people have rather than just the generality so there's certainly an issue about that um, there's an issue about enforceability because local authorities are not going to go around telling people uh, well not formally saying you know the remedy is judicial review but uh, there is an issue about uh, the fundamental remedy not being built into the legislation and maybe there needs to be thought about telling people more about that i think in england there is a, a statutory appeal process there is not a statutory appeal process in scotland judicial review has it serves a function but i think you probably got to be fairly sophisticated to know about that um it works quickly once you get going with it but one of the issues is that if a local authority is systematically unable to fulfil its statutory functions, it can get away with avoiding judicial review by just settling, giving somebody accommodation for one night or two nights, or whatever it is, um, but the problem reoccurring. And I, I can't comment on the circumstances of the person you're talking about, but that is something that happens on a fairly regular basis, that there is no permanent systematic provision made for the right sort of temporary accommodation. And that is one area of strategic litigation that we maybe need to look at, is not just to say this person needs this, but these people need this, this, and this. And that's maybe something that well, we are interested in looking into. Um, so I suppose the conclusion about that is it's quite easy to get round a local authority that needs to get round their obligations, and I'm not suggesting anybody wants to do this, that, that needs to, can quite easily do that with this group, because it takes a long time for the thing to go through the system and people realise, which is, I suppose, why people need more of a voice, and it's great you've heard evidence from a service user. Kenneth Gibson? And, and you say in your, in your submission, as you touched on, and you quote that there should be a system in place where people offered accommodation are directed to law centres to ensure they're fully aware of their rights and the possible consequences of refusing accommodation before they refuse the accommodation. And that, that is on the back of uh, another uh, rights-based issue. You said that homeless people are at present only offered one property, which if they refuse, the local authority can discharge their duty to provide permanent That's accommodation. Right, yes, and so yes. people don't really are not really given information with regard to the consequences of that. Well, that can be very serious. Yes. I mean, a flexible local authority and if people are going through housing options and so forth, that's not necessarily the case, but the statutory obligation is one offer. And we have come across really terrible cases where people mm -hmm. have said, oh, I wanted someone with a garden. I mean, an idiotic reason, possibly in that context, but they didn't realise that they were really causing themselves major problems. So mm -hmm. there is a need for the right sort of advice um, possibly a bit more formally than most housing providers want because that's a form of accountability that everyone tries to avoid to some extent. I'm not yeah, that's why you said you wanted it in writing, actually. Yeah, in yes, yes. Yeah. Well, I think there's a fair, fair amount of what's done informally. Mm -hmm. So to have things more formal and the, 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 the... Well, that's why the Code of Guidance really needs to be rewritten to explain 
all the glitches in detail so that everybody knows, all advice workers can know. A doctor who doesn't, not an expert in the field, wants to check it out can, and everybody knows how, how the system operates. At the moment, there is no one place to go. Can I ask Mr Nicky Brown from a different perspective to comment on that, please? And then I'll come to Jamie Stewart, who's been catching mm -hmm. my eye. Of course. I mean, I think um, certainly in Edinburgh, we, we operate a choice-based letting system where people are required to place bids for accommodation, uh, for permanent or settled accommodation. And that is um, through both the local authority and our RSL partners. Um, and we, we do operate a, 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 the system where if you're offered an accommodation, a, a flat or a house that you have bid for and you refuse it, um, then we can discharge your duties. What I would say is, though, in the majority of cases, um, we will be flexible with people if there's a valid reason for that. Sometimes we get uh, medical information or information from the police or whatever it might be, and we'll look flexibly upon that. And there is an appeal system, and that's clearly outlined both um, at the point of presentation and right throughout the duration of their case. One of the things that we always do is maintain contact with people just to check that they are bidding for housing um, and that the bids are suitable, that they're the right size and they're in the area that they say they wanted to bid for. So we do that anyway. So throughout the entire uh, case management process we have, we're constantly speaking to people about the choice-based letting system and what that means and ensuring that there is clear as possible that the very definition of a choice-based letting system is when you choose a property to move into as a local authority, unless there's a, 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 an exceptional reason for it, we would expect you to take that property. So we're constantly um, working with people to ensure that they know what their responsibilities are and our responsibilities as well in terms of choosing the house that they want to move into. Okay, and Mr Stewart, you wanted to come in? Yeah, certainly the pick-up on this issue of refusals, and I think there are, there, there are a, a lot of people who do go through the, the system, particularly in the context that, that, that I'm in, where uh, people do refuse uh, accommodation. The reasons for, again, just not, not always entirely clear. The understanding's not entirely there. And return to the idea that when, when, we, when, when we have, um, that when support systems are in place, they don't seem to uh, to to be consistent. They don't seem to regular to to, to properly assess people's uh, needs and their aspirations and their uh, and their expectations. And that there is, and it does seem that um, there are statistics we've been given certainly that that it, that's quite high the level of refusals within the refugee populations and we need to dig down into well, why why is that the case certainly level of understanding has got to be part of it and level of understanding of what you can expect and what and what um, is going to be given uh, or going, going to be available to you uh, that uh, you what to what extent choice um, you know cho choice we talked a lot about choice we talked a lot about options and things like that um, do you have a choice or do you not have a choice is it one and that's it and that should be made very very clear to people and that people need to be supported independent um, advocacy and uh, support has a has a big place in this. Um, at the moment, I think uh, some of that is being taken up by housing support agencies, um, and but I don't think that's necessarily what the uh, uh, the intention of the housing support legislation was all about. Um, uh, supporting people to to uh, to to get that uh, to to decide, um, you know, should I accept this property and and a system which allow people a small amount of time. We've had situations where people have said, right, um, I don't like that house because, um, and I can't, and I, and, I, and I don't want that house because, and the housing association is saying, ah, well, you've got until tomorrow to decide. Um, you might, you must must make a decision. Do you want it? Do you not want it? Um, with someone with limited understanding, limited orientation, limited language abilities, that's incredibly challenging. Um, uh, add into that effect the community community misinformation I think there are still well, there are still lots of people who think you know what you're in Glasgow you're going to get three three options you're going to get three choices never take your first one because the first one's going to be rubbish yeah so it's just that level of of, of, um, of community misinformation we need to be doing work on that and there needs to be more support and advocacy around it Thank you. Mr Gibson, do you have further lines of question? It is actually to Mr Stewart, and it's about, the, the, about refugees specifically, and you've said in your submission in Section 16, you talk about the two-tier approach between uh, the schemes given to Syrian Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme, uh, for which local authorities have been secured 
able to secure settled housing from day one and the those who claim protection through the asylum process. It's just about the difference between that. And just also on this, um, you've, you've, you've talked about the need for the creation of a Scottish anti-destitution strategy. I wonder if you can touch on that too without going through all nine points because we've obviously gone <laughs> down here. Thanks. But the philosophy behind it. You know. We the are in rather a rush now. Thanks. Okay. So the philosophy behind um, the well, the Syrian VPR um, has, is I think there's, a, there's there's first of all need with Syrian VPR to to have a look at practice because practice isn't consistent across the country um, to look at where the successes are. But people have been and the information that we've been getting that there are really good examples of practice where people have been uh, provided with accommodation, um, usually sublet by the council from a housing association, but not in all circumstances. Um, and then after a couple of months, once people are settled in, once people have got their, their their benefits and and all those sorts of things that accommodation is effectively flipped from uh, uh from the council through to a full-time uh, tenancy and those examples where we that, that we've seen have, have been very very successful so to look at those uh, examples i think we do need to because it's not consistent across the country by any such imagination some local authorities using more private running sector um than others some putting more uh, using more di different and the, the issue of si silo working there's different levels of silo working some of the local authorities we see have got so many different agencies involved in all this um that there's that we, we could be using that as an example more widely as to how you get lots of different agencies involved um what was the other part of the, the question again uh well the bit was about the destitution strategy about destitution strategy yeah um it touches on what i was saying about there are not I don't think there are at the moment in the current statutory structure. Um, it, it, it's not. It's not. It's not possible to to, to necessarily deal with uh, to, to to say there's a solution across across the board. So long as people don't have access to public uh, funds, and some people do, um, but to put in place a destitution strategy which looks at what is the possible, what is the possible uh, for for Scottish government to do to pick out of uh, their of, of, of the, their responsibilities. And there are lots of areas where uh, Scottish government can and does get involved, or, or Scottish local authorities do, for example, through uh, social work services, through the allocation of funds for ad advocacy and support and advice services, um, and those sorts of things for people who um, wouldn't be able to apply as homeless, but might their, their their destitution might be alleviated, but going all the way through to after people have moved on from temporary accommodation, people still find themselves destitute, taking into account the stuff that we talked about about universal credit, people will be destitute well past their uh, well past their uh, their their uh, 28 day move on period, and that where we with that strategy can target those areas, um, and it's not just and, and and I don't think it is the and the. Uh, the committee wasn't just dealing with refugees and asylum seekers as well. It was dealing with people um, with insecure immigration status as well, um, and which is an issue which I don't, it hasn't really been um, touched on. Really, kind of really, or re really, really kind of focused on how how do we delineate this? How do we how do we work out? You're destitute because you're of, of this issue. This is your solution and. Uh, the Perhaps I could ask Mr. Brown to very Paul Brown to very briefly comment on that status, the immigration status. I think you made some comment in your written statement on uh, this. Well, when people get status, housing doesn't necessarily go along with it. On various occasions, we've had ten people waiting in the waiting room saying, "You know, I'm homeless." There does there is a joining up that needs to be done. Um, I I think there's willingness on the part of the local authority to do that it just needs to happen i mean it all sort of goes back to the need to really systematically look at unintended consequences and unfortunately you know those sitting on the horizon is the as welfare reform but there are other issues as well we're well over time now and i'm going to ask my colleague andy whiteman to finish off this session with some quick lines of questioning please <laughs> yes i'll just ask three brief questions and it's up to you which which of you want to pick up which one? Uh, first of all, on the back of um, uh, Kenny Gibson's uh, question, there are Thomas Lyon ended up in his 10-year cycle of homelessness, etc., because his private sector landlord went bankrupt and the creditors evicted him. 
Uh, that remains a grounds of eviction in the new legislation, private tenancies legislation. I'm just wondering if you agree, perhaps just Paul would address that, if that's still valid. Grounds for eviction. Second, housing first, brief comments. We had discussion in the previous session, but your feelings and views on that briefly. And um, third, um, have you any comments on the Scottish Government's proposed, indeed it's, it's setting up of the short life working group to end rough sleeping? Take the first two questions first. I'll ask specifically Paul Brown to respond on the specific question that was put to you. Um, the grounds for eviction. Do you mind if I send a written submission on making that absolutely clear? Because I don't want to in any way. There's nuances and complexities, but it's certainly an area of concern. So the second question. The second question is housing first. first general comments. Wish to comment uh, on I that. don't think I'm positioned to talk okay. about housing policy issues. I mean, we focus on legal issues of okay. um, I have personal views. Thank you very to. much, but Mr Nicky Brown does um, wish to comment. Very quickly, just to say that uh, as Housing First, I think um, from a local authority perspective, I think most people are bought into it. I think that's absolutely something that we'll consider as a local authority. We've just set up our own um, task force as well in Edinburgh, so that will be elect elected member-led. Um, and one of the key things that um, I require to do a briefing for them is on Housing First and the different models. And just quickly, it was really interesting to hear about the Helsinki model because the, the, the other reports or the other um, academic work that's been going on is very clear about the process you need to follow for introducing Housing First. So it's really interesting to hear that Finland have chosen to do it a different way. Thank you. And before I come to the Scottish Government's um, short life expert working group, can I ask each of you, if you wish to make a comment on that, can you also then make a comment, any last comment that you want to make that you feel we haven't covered? If there's one point that you would like us to consider that we haven't covered, now is your chance. I'll start with Mr Conley. Can I just make a comment on Housing First? Of course. First, right. yeah. It's a model that many of our members have, organisations have, have adopted. And, and, and I suppose, as uh, Mr Brown there said, um, it... it the early, the early kind of implementation of Housing First was pretty fundamentalist and rigid. I think in terms of implementing it, there has to be a flexibility. And I think, you know, Lorraine McGrath highlighted that as, as very succinctly. So, yes, I would, we, would, we, we would support it 100% for the, for, the, for the Scottish Government to, to do it because our, our members have embraced it, but not in a fundamentalist way that okay. there is flexibility built in. And, and the also, expert working group, do you have... Some issue, uh, opinions I, on that? I don't have any, I don't have any, any opinion. Is there on that, anything no. that you want to just put on the record that we haven't touched mm -hmm. on very briefly? I just think in terms of also was talked about this morning, the psychology and foreign environments is, is, is a very valid model, which is, is, is ro being rolled out in the voluntary sector. So okay. I, I would like to see that, the, 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 the Scottish Government embrace that and promote that, because it, it focuses on the emotional and psychological needs of people and not just about... The, the, all, all the physical stuff. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mr Stewart, Expert Working Group, and any final short comment that you feel hasn't been touched upon? Yeah, uh, the Housing First thing focuses really on, on multiple and complex needs and um, to get rid of this idea of tenancy readiness. What I would like the, uh, the sort of focus of I think that's that's absolutely valid and should be uh, an ongoing theme moving forward, particularly for for the for the short life group as well. Um, but to have this uh, idea that although the the rest of the people, the people who maybe don't have multiple and complex needs, they, those people still need have needs and have support needs, and that the and that the the idea of that assessment should still be central. To do that, you need accurate assessment. You need be you need to be able to get um, you need to be able to get at people's needs and aspirations, and um, and, and all the all the other things. Something which I think um, in the implementation of what's happening as of what's going on is not happening now. What that will have an effect on doing is if we can push people through homeless systems where there is supply, and as I say in Glasgow, there appears to be that. Um, the, that it, it frees up this, uh, it frees up temporary accommodation, it frees up the, the rest of the system, and is, uh, and is we, we talked about preventative spend um, and all that, an, it is a form of preventative spend. So the, the, the message I think is, yes, Housing First is important, but there's also this, 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 this rest of, the, of the, the, the homeless population who won't qualify for Housing First, they don't have multiple and complex needs and all those things, they do have needs, those needs must be assessed, and by assessing and intervening early in those cases, we will, we, we will um, 
in turn free up the rest of the system to uh, to, to to deal with things uh, that that are perhaps more difficult to deal with. And there are people with multiple and complex needs who fall within the refugee population. Um, it certainly is true, and those and we would like to see those people being dealt with intensively. Um, the 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 other uh, body of people. Who might need support with orientation they might need um uh, the the advocacy on their behalf um that that itself has a has a knock-on effect and is and is able to kind of um get people what they what they need but also systemically it it, it frees up the system okay thank you mr paul brown expert working group and any final remark um well i think that any working groups great news but i would hope that it's done in an open way one of the fundamental things that we lack is lack of debate and discussion. I wouldn't see an expert working group as functioning well if it just goes off, applies its expertise and produces a whole load of proposals. It needs to be an open system, possibly taking evidence individually, possibly having a series of conferences or workshops. That's what needs to happen. Um, there is no one person who is an expert in everything about this. In fact, a fundamental problem has been on the occasion when people have thought they are. So that I would say that's a fundamental thing. And the other thing that I would hope, and I'm sure everyone shares this, is to try and get over to the public as a whole and policymakers. The result of all our experience and research is that this problem is caused by poverty and disadvantage and that this isn't some sort of strange, peculiar personality defect that people have, which has too often comes up as people's answer to everything about it. And we have the great advantage that I think recent research has been produced that shows that pretty comprehensively. So we can go out there with 100% confidence and say that. I think if we can get that message over and get that approach into the code of guidance and any further reform, I think some real things will have been achieved. Thank you very much. And last word, Mr Nick Brown. Um, I would just echo some of the stuff that Paul was saying there about poverty and disadvantage, but just finally I'll, I'll keep my comments on the working group until we've seen some actions coming from it. <laughs> thank you very much and can I thank you all for coming along. I apologise again for the delay, but I think that we have uh, managed to allocate sufficient time as much as we could to this particular session and panel. So thank you all very much for coming along and can I now move the committee into private session for the next agenda item. Thank you. Thank you.